This will be the women's health section of Pants Prep Pearls audio. So first we'll start with acute mastitis. This is an infection of the breast most common in lactating women secondary to nipple trauma, especially prima gravida in the first six weeks postpartum. The most common etiologies are staph aureus and also strep and candida. Clinical manifestations, unilateral localized breast pain, tenderness, warmth, swelling, induration, and skid redness. Also crack, cracked nipples or visible fissure. May have purulent nipple discharge. Symptoms include um, fever, myalgias, and chills. For diagnosis, mostly clinical, but you could also culture the breast milk in some cases um, if you need culture and sensitivities. Imaging usually reserved for cases not responding to empiric antibiotics in two to three days. For management, you want to be supportive using warm or cold compresses, breast pump, or anti-inflammatory meds. You can also use anti-staphylococcal antibiotics like dicloxacillin and nafcillin. Cephalosporins would also work. Erythromycin can be used if penicillin allergic. And if it is candidal, fluconazole. And for this, mothers are encouraged to continue breastfeeding. Milk drainage, either by breastfeeding, pumping, or hand expression, is critical for resolution of the infection and for relief of symptoms. Next, from acute mastitis to breast abscess, this is a rare complication of acute mastitis. This is most common in lactating women, again, secondary to nipple trauma, especially prima gravida. Etiologies, staph aureus, and again, strep and candida possible. Clinical manifestations, similar to acute mastitis with the unilateral breast pain, especially one quadrant, with tenderness, warmth, or swelling. Cracked nipples or visible fissures, in duration and fluctuance due to the pus underneath. They may also have a purulent nipple discharge. So the induration and fluctuance is one of the factors that differentiates the breast abscess from just the acute mastitis. And again, diagnosis is clinical. An ultrasound may be ordered if there's a question of cellulitis versus abscess. An ill-defined mass with septations if breast abscess with septations. For management, you want to do drainage via needle aspiration, a lactational abscess, or incision in drainage plus antibiotics. Again, antibiotics are dicloxacillin, cephalexin, clindamycin. If MRSA is suspected, you can use Bactrim or Clinda. Breast infections, including breast abscess, is not a contraindication to breastfeeding. Milk drainage, breastfeeding, pumping, or hand expression is important to facilitate resolution of the infection. Next, congestive mastitis. This is bilateral breast enlargement two to three days postpartum due to milk stasis. Bilateral breast pain and swelling. Breast drainage is the mainstay of treatment, manually or a pump. If woman does not want to breastfeed, treat with ice packs, analgesics, and breast drainage. If breastfeeding is desired, manually empty the breasts completely after baby is done breastfeeding. Local heat, analgesics, and continue nursing. That was for congestive mastitis. Fibrocystic breast changes. These are non-cancerous, fluid-filled breast cysts due to exaggerated response to hormones, also known as glandular hyperplasia, duct dilation, breast cyst, and stromal fibrosis. Most common benign breast disorder in reproductive-aged women, especially 30 to 50 often regress after menopause as it is an exaggerated response to hormones. Clinical manifestations, multiple painful or painless breast masses that may increase or decrease in size with menstrual changes, often worse prior to menstruation. Physical exam, usually multiple, nodular, sm uh, mobile, smooth, round, or ovoid lumps in both breasts of varying sizes often bilateral and not usually associated with axillary lymph node involvement. Not associated with lymph node involvement. Most commonly in the upper, outer section of the breast. Ultrasound is diagnostic. You can also do a fine needle aspiration in which you would see straw colored or green fluid with no blood, but this is not usually performed. A mammogram may be required if the lesion is suspicious or persistent after drainage. 
However, for diagnosis overall, ultrasound is the first initial choice. Management is just supportive with observation, supportive bra, warm and cooled comp cold compresses, and analgesics. Oral contraceptives may help, as this is a hormonal involvement, and fine needle aspiration to remove fluid is diagnostic and therapeutic, but only in complex cases is when you would do this. Next, fibroadenoma of the breast. This is a benign solid tumor composed of glandular and fibrous tissue. Second most common benign breast mass after fibrocystic disease, and most common breast tumor in women under 30, increased incidence in African Americans. Manifestations? It's a breast mass, usually non-tender, but may become tender prior to menstruation, gradually grows over time, but may enlarge in pregnancy, and does not change significantly with the menstrual cycle, where fibrocystic changes do. Physical exam, firm, solitary, non-tender, smooth, well-circumscribed, freely mobile, rubbery lump in the breast, usually two to three centimeters, and again, no axillary involvement. Diagnosis, clinically, you can also do an ultrasound, which will show that solid, well-circumscribed avascular mass, and FNA is definitive. Fibrous tissue and collagen arranged in a swirl is uh, pathognomonic on the FNA for fibroadenoma of the breast. Collagen arranged in a swirl on FNA. Management, conservative. Observation and reassurance and follow-up, most small tumors will resorb over time, can repeat ultrasound in three to six months. If you want to do excision, may be needed if it's enlarging and after repeat ultrasounds or large masses. Cryoablation, alternative to surgery if under four centimeters. Next, we'll move into gynecomastia. This is enlargement of the glandular breast tissue and adipose tissue in males due to increased effective estrogen increased production or reduced degradation due to decreased androgens. Hormonal, seen in three main groups, infants, due to high maternal estrogen, also seen during puberty, especially 10 to 14 years old, classically may last between six months to two years during this age range, and also older males, so infants during puberty, 10 to 14 years, and older males. Mostly idiopathic, and persistent perbutal gynecomastia also. Medications, very importantly, spironolactone, ketoconazole, cimetidine, 5-alpha reductase inhibitors like finasteride and dutasteride, digoxin, GnRH agonists like luprolide, thiazides, phenothiazines, verapamil, and theophylline. Others, malignancy, large cell lung cancer, renal cell cancer, hepatic, testicular, and gastric cancers, cirrhosis especially, hyperthyroidism, chronic renal disease, also Klinefelter syndrome and alcoholism can lead to this gynecomastia. Clinical manifestations, a palpable mass of tissue at least 0.5 centimeters in diameter, centrally located, usually underlying the nipple, symmetrical, classically bilateral and often tender to palpation. So this is bilateral. Diagnosis is clinical. You can check their testosterone levels and you may want to do a mammogram if breast cancer is suspected. Management is supportive. Stop the offending medication. Obser observation if early in the disease course or physiologic. If treatment is needed, initiate it within the first six months of onset. After 12 months, fibrosis may occur. Medications. Tamoxifen is a CIRM, selective estrogen receptor modifier, that is an estrogen antagonist in the breast. Often the first line medication if medical management is indicated. Androgens can be used in hypogonadism. For surgical, this is reserved for severe disease refractory to medical management. Large breasts, cosmetically unappealing, as well as fibrosis. Next is breast cancer. This is the most common non-skin malignancy in women, and they have a 1 in 8 lifetime incidence. Second most common cause of cancer death in women after lung cancer. Risk factors, genetics, the BRCA or BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene, 
genetic mutation occurs is associated with 60 to 80% lifetime development of breast cancer, 15 to 40% development of ovarian cancer as well. BRCA positive positivity is seen in 5 to 10% of cases of breast cancer and first degree relatives with breast cancer. Also increasing age, over 50% are over 60 years old. Increased number of menstrual cycles, nulliparity, never having kids, late first full-term pregnancy, over 35, early onset of menarche, under 12, late menopause, and never having breastfed. So just the overall increase in menstrual cycles. And then also increased estrogen exposure. Postmenopausal hormonal replacement therapy, prolonged unopposed estrogen, obesity, and alcohol use. Endometrial cancer increases the risk of breast cancer and vice versa. For types, infiltrative ductal carcinoma is the most common type at 75%. That's infiltrative ductal carcinoma. Associated with lymphatic metastasis, especially axillary, ductal carcinoma in situ does not penetrate to the basement membrane. There's also infiltrative lobular carcinoma, and that's 10%. There's medullary, medullary, mucinoid, tubular, papillary, metastatic, and inflammatory as well. And also of note is Paget's disease of the breast. This is a ductal carcinoma presenting as an eczematous nipple lesion, may have bloody discharge from the nipple. So once again, infiltrative, most common, infiltrative ductal, that is, lobular, 10%, and also Paget's disease of the breast. Premalignant lesions, lobular carcinoma in situ, not considered cancer, but is associated with increased risk of invasive breast cancer in either breasts. Atypical ductal hyperplasia as well. Clinical manifestations, painless, hard, fixed, immobile lump is the most common presentation. May be mobile early on and may be painful in under 10%. May complain of unilateral discharge, which may be bloody as well. And remember, painless and immobile. On physical exam, the mass is most common in the upper outer quadrant, 65%, and sometimes in the areola, 18%. Skin changes, asymmetric erythema, discoloration, ulceration, skin retraction, dimpling if Cooper's ligament is involved, changes in breast size and contour, nipple inversion, and skin thickening. Locally advanced disease, axillary lymphadenopathy. Metastatic disease, most common sites are bone, vertebrae, ribs, pelvis, and the femur, lungs, which may lead to dyspnea and cough, as well as liver. So bone, brain, lungs, and liver for the most common areas for metastatic breast cancer. And Paget's disease of the breast, you'll see a chronic eczematous, itchy, scaly rash on the nipples and areola, under 5% of uh, cases though, a lump is often present. If there's inflammatory breast cancer, this is red, swollen, warm, and an itchy breast, often with nipple retraction, pu de orange, which is skin changes looking like the peel of an orange due to lymphatic obstruction. This is associated with a poor prognosis, and it's usually not associated with a lump. That's pu de orange in inflammatory breast cancer. So next for diagnosis of a breast mass, a combination of physical exam, mammography, and FNA, or core biopsy is highly accurate. Ultrasound is sometimes used to see if the mast is cystic. Mammography is the initial modality to evaluate breast masses in women over 40. Microcalcifications and spiculated masses are highly suspicious for malignancy. The use of ultrasound is recommended as the initial modality under 40 years old women due to the high density of breast tissue. May also, use, may also be used to guide FNA with biopsy or determine if a mass seen on, mem, uh, on mammogram is cystic or solid. So ultrasound under 40, mammography over 40.
Also, an MRI has some role with rapid uptake of contrast being characteristic of malignant mass. Biopsy options, FNA, fine needle aspiration. The advantages are that it removes the least amount of tissue, but the disadvantage is that if positive, it doesn't allow for receptor testing. For instance, estrogen, progesterone, and HER2 or NEU receptor testing, and it's associated with a false negative in about 10%. Um, so it also doesn't detect invasion, um, but it does leave no scarring. So in contrast, you have the large needle or core biopsy. The advantages of this are allows for receptor testing if positive. So estrogen again, progesterone, HER2, and NU. Disadvantages can leave a greater deformity with the procedure, and the needle may miss the lesion as well. This is done with anesthesia, and it detects invasion as well. There's also open biopsy, which is the advantage of the most accurate diagnostic test and allows for a frozen section to be done, followed by immediate resection of the cancer, followed by a sentinel node biopsy. Breast cancer management. Treatment based on the TNM staging. Metastatic workup recommended for stage 3 and above. Early stage cancer. Breast conservation therapy also known as a lumpectomy, with sentinel node biopsy, plus follow-up radiation, usually preferred when possible. A negative sentinel node eliminates the need for axillary lymph node dissection. Modified radical mastectomy may be needed if diffuse, large tumor, prior radiation to the breast, or if radical or if radiation post-lumpectomy is contraindicated. For radiation therapy, this is usually done after lumpectomy, or post-mastectomy to destroy residual tumor cells, such as external beam radiation or brachytherapy. You also have anti-estrogen hormonal therapy. In estrogen receptor positive tumors, this is when you do it, and it's tamoxifen, most useful in premenopausal patients. ER, estrogen receptor positivity, is associated with a better prognosis. And note, there are some adverse effects of tamoxifen like VTE and endometrial cancer risk. Aromatase inhibitor hormonal therapy. This is the most useful in postmenopausal women with ER positive patients. The meds here are ALE, anastrozole, letrozole, and exemestane. And these aromatase inhibitors are slightly more effective than tamoxifen but come with the side effect of osteoporosis. So, difference between tamoxifen is typically used in the ER positive premenopausal, and uh, the aromatase inhibitors, the ALE, are typically used in the postmenopausal ER positive patients. Now, for anti HER2 NEU hormonal therapy, this is a drug called trastuzumab. HER2 positivity is associated with more aggressive tumors, and the adverse effects of this drug are cardiotoxicity. For adjuvant chemotherapy, this is used to treat any residual disease. Indications include lesions over 1 cm, positive axillary lymphadenopathy, breast cancer stages 2 through 4, and inoperable disease, especially estrogen receptor negative disease, which has a worse prognosis. And some of these adjuvant chemo drugs um, include doxorubicin, which, remember, can cause dilated cardiomyopathy, cyclophosphamide, fluorouracil, and docetyl. Next, for breast cancer screening. Importantly, the mammogram is the best screening in over 40-year-old women. This detects breast cancer as early as two years before a mass can be palpated clinically. Breast self-exam has not been shown to reduce long-term overall mortality. Average risk patients, the USPSTF guidelines recommend mammogram every two years beginning at age 50 to 75. Women over the age of 75 can be offered screening in, if their life expectancy is at least 10 years, and when you would offer it would be every two years. So mammogram every two years, 50 to 75. Moderate risk. Most patients with first-degree relative with breast cancer would put them in this category. 
In some patients, screening at age 50 and every two years or 10 years prior to the age of the first degree relative that was diagnosed, whichever is earlier, similar to the colon cancer screenings. Women with breast implants should undergo the same screening um, schedule as women without implants. In the clinical breast exam, at least every three years in women 20 to 40, and then annually after 40. Breast cancer prevention, SERMs, selective estrogen receptor modulators. Tamoxifen and raloxifen are SERMs that can be used for breast cancer prevention in high-risk individuals. Tamoxifen and raloxifen can be used in postmenopausal women over 35 years with high risk or patients that are over 35 years old. Treatment is usually for five years total and tamoxifen is preferred. It's more effective but associated with endometrial cancer as a side effect. Tamoxifen also is associated with increased risk of DVT compared with raloxifen. Also, there's aromatase inhibitors, your ALE, and these are best for postmenopausal uh, ER uh, sensitive breast cancers. And these are used as an alternative to SERMs. So remember, tamoxifen, side effect DVT and endometrial cancer, although it's more effective than raloxifene. Next, we'll move to HPV vaccination. HPV type 16 and 18 cause about 70% of all cervical cancers worldwide and nearly 90% of anal cancers as well as a significant portion of oropharyngeal cancer, vulvar, vaginal, and penile cancer. HPV types 6 and 11 cause 90% of genital warts and anal warts too, which can evolve to condyloma acuminata. So 16 and 18 are cervical cancers and other cancers, and 6 and 11 are warts. So indications for HPV vaccination, you have for females, given in women age 11 to 26, and for males, given in ages 11 to 21. Men who have sex with men and individuals with weakened immune systems can be vaccinated until age 26, like females. For vaccines, Gardasil 9 is preferred. This covers nine strains, so it targets the same as Gardasil, with the 6, 11, 16, and 18 most importantly but it also covers 31, 33, 45, 52, and 58 for the Gardasil 9 vaccine. For the regular Gardasil, once again, that's 6, 11, 16, and 18. For dosing, if they're under 15 years old, you want to do two, two doses of HPV at least six months apart. If they're over 15 or immunocompromised, they should receive three doses over a minimum of six months classically administered at day zero, two months, and at six months. The minimal interval between the first two doses is four weeks, and the minimal interval between the second dose is the third and 12 weeks. HPV vaccines is contraindicated if pregnant or lactating. So remember, under 15 years old, two doses, six months apart. Over 15, three doses, zero, two, and six. Next, we'll move to cervical insufficiency, also known as incompetent cervix. This is an inability to maintain pregnancy secondary to premature cervical dilation, especially in the second trimester. So this is a problem with the cervix. Risk factors, previous cervical trauma or, protect, or procedure, such as a LEAP procedure, a, a cut with wires, um, kind of like a skimmer, or cervical colonization, conization rather, which is a cut using a cone um, on the cervix. Uterine defects as well as DES exposure in utero are all risk factors. Clinical manifestations of cervical insufficiency, usually asymptomatic, may develop pressure, Braxton-Hicks-like contractions, bleeding or vaginal discharge, especially in the second trimester. Painless dilation and effacement of the cervix are hallmark signs. So incompetent in staying closed, and thus with pressure, it dilates and effaces. For diagnosis, is clinical, and transvaginal ultrasound is the most accurate and predictive to measure cervical length. Findings include wide internal os, shortening of the cervical canal, hourglass appearance, 
bulging of the fetal membranes into the os, an insufficiency is present if cervical length 25 millimeters, 2.5 centimeters, or less before 24 weeks. So the dilation and effacement is under 25 millimeters in under 24 weeks. Management, cerclage, suturing of the cervical os, and bed rest, especially if prior history. If not performed initially, cerclage can also be performed for women who develop a short cervix under 25 millimeters before 24 weeks as determined by ultrasound surveillance. You may also do a weekly injection of 17-alpha-hydroxyprogesterone in addition uh, in some women with preterm birth history. And remember, the cervix has no nerve ending, so this is not painful. And the cerclage is like a purse string, so it's sutured through and then pulled tight, so it, it stays shut. Next will be infertility. Failure to conceive after one year of regular unprotected sexual intercourse. One full year. 60% of couples achieve pregnancy in the first three years in the absence of any cause of infertility. Etiologies in males, they're 40% of the causes, usually abnormal spermatogenesis. And etiologies in females, typically anovulatory cycles, which remember, clomiphene can be used, clomid, or ovarian dysfunction, which is 30%, congenital or acquired disorders as well. For diagnosis, you want to do hysterosalpingography, HSG, which helps evaluate tubal patency and abnormalities. So this is contrasting to the vagina and uterus and watch it disseminate through the tubes to see if there's any abnormality or lack of patency. Management, clomiphene induces ovulation. And if there's amenorrhea or oligomenorrhea, you should correct endocrine problems to improve fertility. IUD insemination, intrauterine insemination, in vitro fertilization, especially if fallopian tube defect is present. So next, we'll move to the cervical cancer screening. So there's a complex chart here. Um, first, for normal patients in the ages of 21 to 24 years old, a pap smear should be done every three years with their first pap smear at 21 years old. Also for normal patients, if they're 25 to 29, you want to do a continued pap smear every three years. And also for normal patients, if they're over 30 years old and HPV negative, you want to do HPV and pap co-test every five years or pap smear every three years. If they're over 30 and HPV positive, you want to do co-testing every one year or HPV genotype testing. For ASCUS, atypical squamous cells of undetermined significance. For patients 21 to 24, you want to do a pap smear every one year or reflex HPV test. For 25 to 29, you want to do a reflex HPV test, which is preferred, or a pap testing in one year. If they're over 30 years and HPV negative, you want to do repeat co-testing in three years. And if they're over 30 and HPV positive, you want to do colposcopy. If they have LSIL, which is low-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, you want to repeat the PAP in one year if they're 21 to 24. If they're 25 to 29, you do colposcopy. If they're over 30 and HPV negative, you want to do colposcopy and repeat the pap in one year. If they're over 30 and HPV positive, you want to do colposcopy. If they have atypical cells, can't exclude HSIL, this is ASCH, or if they have HSIL, high-grade squamous cell intraepithelial lesion, you just want to continue to do colposcopy in any case. Excisional treatment options include the loop electrosurgical excision procedure. This is also called LEAP, cold knife conization, or laser conization. 
For HSIL, or high-grade squamous cell intraepithelial lesion, which is CIN2, you, want, you can do, for moderate dysplasia, excision or ablation. Excision would be the LEAP procedure or cold knife conization, and ablation would be cryocautery, laser cautery, or electrocautery. And HSIL also could be a CIN3, a cervical intraepithelial neoplasia 3. And this is severe dysplasia, or it could be even be a full thickness carcinoma in situ that hasn't invaded the basement membrane. And again, you would still do excision or ablation. Now moving to cervical cancer, the third most common gynecologic cancer. <coughs> First is endometrial, second is ovarian. Most commonly metastasized to the local areas, like the vagina, parametrium, and pelvic lymph nodes. So remembering this is one, the most common is EOC, E, also known as uterine, but endometrial. The second most common is O, ovarian, and the third most common is C, cervical. Mo major types, squamous cell carcinoma is the most common at 90% of cervical cancer. Adenocarcinoma, 10%. Also, clear cell carcinoma is a type linked with DES exposure. For the spread, in order, primary nodes involved in the spread of cervical cancer include the paracervical, most common, parametrial, obturator, hypogastric, external iliac, and sacral. But this cancer often takes 2 to 10 years for carcinoma to penetrate the basement membrane, so it's very slow-growing cervical cancer. Risk factors? Human papillomavirus is associated with 99%, especially 16 and 18 but also 31 and 33, 45, 52, and 58 to a less ex lesser extent. So most common 16 and 18 at 70%, then 31 and 33. Early onset of sexual activity, increased number of sexual partners, smoking, DES exposure, diethylstilbestrol was a synthetic estrogen used in OCPs, also cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, CIN, and immunosuppression and STIs are risk factors. Also, 40 to 50 years is the most common age range for diagnosis because it takes so long for it to grow. Clinical manifestations, cervical cancer is usually asymptomatic in early stages. Postcoital bleeding or spotting is the most common symptom, friable cervical epithelium. Irregular or heavy vaginal bleeding or watery vaginal discharge. Advanced disease may present with pelvic or back pain. Physical examination may have cervical discharge or ulceration if invasive. Diagnosis is colposcopy with biopsy. So you do pap smear, then HPV test for type, then colposcopy with biopsy. For management of cervical cancer, if it's carcinoma in situ, which is stage zero, you want to do excision, which is preferred. Loop electrical excision procedure, the LEAP, cold knife conization or ablation, cryotherapy or laser. You could also do a total abdominal hysterectomy plus a bilateral salpingo ophorectomy, which is the TABSO. Stage one, stage one, <laughs> uh, total hysterectomy, radical hysterectomy or conization. Stage 1A2, 1B or 2A, you could do combined external beam radiation or brachytherapy or radical hysterectomy with, break, with bilateral pelvic lymphadenectomy. If it's locally advanced, radiation plus chemo, cisplatin-based. If it's advanced, you can do radiation plus systemic chemotherapy. Next to spontaneous abortion, a pregnancy that ends before 20 weeks gestation. Almost 80% occur prior to 12 weeks. This includes threatened, inevitable, incomplete, complete, missed, and septic. Threatened is the only one that is potentially viable. Etiologies, chromosomal abnormalities are the most common at 60 to 80% of spontaneous abortions. Maternal factors include STIs, antiphospholipid syndrome, seen sometimes in lupus, trauma, RH isoimmunization, malnutrition, and anatomical abnormalities, such as cervical insufficiency. Also, factor V Leiden, too. 
Manifestations, crampy abdominal pain and vaginal bleeding. Diagnosis, ultrasound, CBC, blood type, and RH screen. RH negative needs Rogam. Serial beta HCG titers and progesterone level. So now to go over the different types of abortions. So first, a threatened abortion, which you'll see the products of conception are intact and the cervical os is closed. The management is supportive. Observe at home, bed rest, and close follow-up to see if either symptoms resolve or progress to abortion. You also want to have serial beta HCG to see if doubling to see if it's viable. For inevitable abortion, the products of conception are intact, but the cervical os is dilated. For your management here, you can do sur surgical evacuation like a DNC under 16 weeks or a DNE over 16 weeks. Medications, you can also use misoprostol and expected management. <laughs> For incomplete abortion, some products of the conception are expelled from the uterus and the cervical os is dilated. Options for this include expectant management, allow the POC to fully pass with serial beta HCG and TVUS to determine when complete, or you could do a surgical evacuation, a DNC under 16 and a DNE over 16 weeks, and uh, once again, medications, misoprostol, if you have a complete abortion, this is all products of conception are expelled from the uterus and the cervical os is usually closed. Rogam, if indicated, follow up with a beta HCG. If there's a missed abortion, the products of, products of conception are intact and the cervical os is closed. For this, you need surgical evacuation, a DNC under 16 or DNE over 16 weeks. Again, medications, misoprostol. If there's a septic abortion, some of the products of conception are retained, the cervical os is closed, and there is cervical motion tenderness. <laughs> you may have a foul brown discharge, fever, and chills. For septic abortion, you'll need a DNE to remove products of conception and broad spectrum antibiotics like levofloxacin and metronidazole. And also of note, all women who are Rh negative should also receive anti-D Rh immunoglobulin, Rogam, at this time for all abortions. And remember, a risk is if the father is Rh positive or the father is unknown. Remember, the risk of fetal blood contacting the mom's blood is still possible. Next, into elective or induced abortion. For medical is M&M, mifepristone, followed by misoprostol. This is done 20 to 48 hours afterwards, and it's safe up to 10 weeks of pregnancy. Mifepristone is a progesterone receptor antagonist that leads to dilation and softening of the cervix and placental separation. Misoprostol is a prostaglandin E1 analog, which causes uterine contractions. Patients must return day 7 to 14 after mifepristone to confirm complete termination of pregnancy. Another option is also methotrexate followed by misoprostol 3 to 7 days later, safe up to 7 weeks. Methotrexate is a folate antagonist, but this regimen is less effective than the mifepristone and misoprostol. Uh, it doesn't have the anti-progesterone effects. You can also do surgical elective abortion, and this can be performed up to 24 weeks from the last menstrual period. A DNC includes usage of a curette or suction curettage, manual or electric vacuum aspiration, used during the first 4 to 12 weeks of gestation. That's a DNC, and also a DNE, dilation and evacuation, is done over 12 weeks of gestation. Placental insufficiency. Impairment or inability of the placenta to provide oxygen and nutrients. Etiologies, placenta previa or abruption. Post-term pregnancy. Intrauterine growth restriction. So in post-term pregnancy for placental insufficiency, the placenta is basically all done doing what it does. 
So over 40 weeks um, need to take action for that pregnancy. Diagnosis for placental insufficiency, fetal heart monitoring. You'll have late decelerations, which are gradual decreases in fetal heart rate initiating at the peak of contraction and into the second half of the contraction due to mechanical compression of the maternal vessels traversing the uterine wall during uterine contractions may be associated with gradual return to heart rate baseline. The management, placing the mother on her side so she doesn't squish her IVC, administering oxygen by mask, and correcting hypotension. So upon uterine contraction, the heart rate decreases, which indicates less blood flow going to the fetus. And at that late period in the contraction, because it takes a second for the baby to realize there's less blood. Multiple gestations is next, associated with a rapid maternal weight gain and growth of the uterus. You can have dizygotic, which is fraternal, due to fertilization of two ova by two different sperm. This is 66%. You can also have monozygotic, identical, formed from a fertilization of one ovum that splits increased risk of fetal transfusion syndrome, and discordant fetal growth. For diagnosis, ultrasound to visualize the fetus, and elevated levels of beta-HCG and maternal serum AFP, alpha fetoprotein, are higher than normal. Maternal complications in multiple gestations, preterm labor, spontaneous abortion, preeclampsia, and anemia. There's also fetal complications, such as intrauterine growth restriction, placental abnormalities, breach presentation, umbilical cord, prolapse, and preeclampsia. Multiple gestations is considered a high-risk pregnancy as well. Next, we'll move to the uncomplicated pregnancy. So for uncomplicated pregnancy, the diagnosis is by serum or urine HCG. For serum HCG, serum quantitative can detect pregnancy as early as five days after conception, as opposed to a urine beta HCG can detect pregnancy 14 days after conception. This is due to increased serum progesterone. On physical examination, uterus changes. You may see the Ladin's sign, which is uterus softening at six weeks. You may see the Hagar's sign, which is uterine isthmus softening at six to eight weeks. Or you may see Piscasex sign, which is a palpable lateral bulge or softening of the uterus cornus seven to eight weeks of gestation. For cervical changes itself, you may see Goodell's sign, cervical softening due to increased vascularization four to five weeks gestation. You could also see Chadwick sign, which is a bluish discoloration or bluish coloration of the cervix and vulva at eight to 12 weeks. Fetal heart tones, 10 to 12 weeks towards the end of the first trimester, and normal is 120 to 160 beats per minute. Pelvic ultrasound detects the fetus at five to six weeks, and fetal movement, 16 to 20 weeks, is, no, is known as quickening. The GPA classification, gravida, para, and abortus. Gravida is the number of times being pregnant overall, regardless if carried to term. Para is the number of births over 20 weeks, including viable or non-viable births, such as stillbirth. Multiple gestations, twins, count as one for notation. Also abortus. Number of pregnancies lost for whatever reason, miscarriage, abortions. For example, G3, P3 means three pregnancies with three births. If they're G4, P3, A1, that would mean there's four pregnancies, three were born, and there was one miscarriage or abortion. Next, fundal height measurement, known as the McDonald's method. Um, 12 weeks should be above the pubic symphysis. At 16 weeks, midway between the pubis and umbilicus. 
at 20 weeks at the umbilicus, and at 38 weeks, two to three centimeters below the xiphoid process. And quickening is at 16 to 20 weeks. Next, prenatal care. You need to know Nagel's rule for the estimated date of delivery. The first day of the last menstrual period plus seven days subtract three months. So plus seven minus three. Routine tests during first prenatal visit. You have to get blood pressure, blood type, and RH, CBC, urinalysis for glucose and protein, random glucose, hepatitis B surface antigen, HIV, syphilis, rubella, screening for sickle cell and cystic fibrosis, and pap smear. For first trimester screening and tests, this is weeks 1 to 12 of the pregnancy. You want to do chromosomal screening tests, such as biochemical screening, may be performed, like a free beta HCG. If it's abnormally high or low, may be indicative of chromosomal abnormalities. You could do a PAP-A, usually, usually low with fetal Down syndrome. PAP-A is serum pregnancy-associated plasma protein A, and this is low with fetal Down syndrome. You can also do nuchal translucency ultrasound at 10 to 13 weeks. Screens for trisomies 13, 18, and 21, Down syndrome. Increased thickness is abnormal. If increased thickness, chorionic villus sampling or amniocentesis is offered. Other tests, ultrasound. Fetal heart tones usually heard around 10 to 12 weeks by Doppler. Transvaginal ultrasound can detect fetal heart activity as early as five to six weeks after last menstrual period. Uterine size and gestation, if abnormal, do CVS or amniocentesis can be offered at around 10 to 13 weeks. CVS, chorionic villus sampling, again may be performed 10 to 13 weeks, preferred technique before 15 weeks, may be offered to women with increased risk of chromosomal abnormalities, including those with a prior child with a chromosomal abnormality, a maternal age over 35, abnormal first or second trimester maternal screening tests, abnormal nuchal lucency, and prior pregnancy losses. So for CVS, some of the advantages are allows for the option of early termination of the pregnancy if abnormalities are found. For disadvantages, performing it increases the risk of spontaneous abortion, increased infection, or fluid leak. Cannot be used in AFP testing for neural tube defects as well as the disadvantage of CVS. Next, the second trimester screenings and tests. This is weeks 13 through 27 of the pregnancy. You want to do this triple screening, which, me which, which measures A, alpha fetoprotein, unconjugated estradiol, and beta HCG, usually at 15 to 20 weeks. And if you want to do the quadruple, it adds inhibin A. So the quadruple is ob I. Alpha fetoprotein, unconjugated estro, estriol, and beta HCG, with a dash and I for inhibin A. So some of these findings may indicate things. If you have alpha fetoprotein that's low, beta HCG that's high, and unconjugated estriol that's low, you may think it's Down syndrome or trisomy 21. If you have a high AFP, then you want to consider open neural tube defects like spina bifida or multiple gestations. If everything's low, you might consider trisomy 18, often born stillborn, or die within the first one year of life. High levels of, of inhibin A indicate a chromosomal abnormality as well. Gestational diabetes is screened 24 to 28 weeks. Amniocentesis may be offered to women, including those with a prior child with a chromosomal abnormality, maternal age over 35, abnormal first or second trimester maternal screening tests, abnormal ultrasound, prior pregnancy losses, usually performed at 15 to 18 weeks. So remember, high beta HCG, think Down syndrome, high alpha fetoprotein, 
think neural tube defects like spina bifida. If they're all low, think trisomy 18. Next, we'll go into neural tube defects. Birth defects of the brain, spine, and spinal cord. The two most common types are spina bifida and anencephaly. Remember, alpha feta protein screens for this. If it's high, consider these. Increased incidence with maternal folate deficiency. Pathophysiology, anencephaly is a failure of closure of the portion of the neural tube that becomes the cerebrum. For spina bifida, this is an incomplete closure of the embryonic neural tubule leads to non-fusion for some of the vertebrae overlying the spinal cords. This may lead to protrusion of the spinal cord through the opening, most commonly seen at the lumbar and sacral areas of the spine. So there's a few different types. First one, spina bifida with myelomeningocele. This is the most common type. This is when the meninges and the spinal cord herniates through the gaps in the vertebrae, and it often leads to disability. This is the most serious since it contains the cord as well. And you can see that myelo is the cord, meningo is the meninges outside of the cord. Next is spina bifida occulta. This is the mildest form. There's no herniation of the spinal cord. It's just the overlying skin may be normal or have some hair grown over it, dimpling of the skin or birthmark over the affected area. If you have spina bifida with meningocele, this is only the meninges herniates through the gap in the vertebrae. So basically only a sac of CSF and no spinal cord within it is spina bifida with meningocele. For clinical manifestations, they may have sensory deficits, paralysis, hydrocephalus, or hypotonia. For screening, you want to get a, a um, serum alpha fetoprotein followed by amniocentesis showing increased alpha fetoprotein and increased acetylcholinesterase. Next, for the third trimester screenings, this is week 28 until birth. You, of course, want to do gestational diabetes screening ages 24 to 28 weeks, repeat antibody titers in RHD negative, antibody negative unsensitized woman, give anti-D RH immunoglobulin, ROGAM, 300 micrograms given at 28 weeks gestation. So you want to give this to these women that are RH negative at 0 and 28 weeks. You want to do an H&H &H at 35 weeks. You want to do GBS, Group B streptococcus screening. Biophysical profile, look at five variables, including fetal breathing, fetal tones, amniotic fluid levels, not, uh, neonatal stress test, and gross fetal movements. Two points for each, maximum score of 10 points. So the non-stress testing, to go over that, this is non-stress testing with a baseline fetal heart rate is 120 to 160. For reactive non-stress test, you want to see over two accelerations of fetal heart rate over 15 beats per minute from the baseline, lasting at least 15 seconds over a 20-minute period. The prognosis means fetal well-being and management repeat weekly or biweekly. If they're non-reactive, this means there's no fetal heart rate accelerations or under 15 beats per minute lasting under 15 seconds. The prognosis may mean sleeping, immature, or compromised fetus. For the management of this, vibratory stimulation to wake the fetus up, or may try contraction stress test. Now the contraction stress test. If you have a, so this contraction stress test measures fetal response to stress at times of uterine contraction just done if we have a non-reactive, non-stress test. So if you have a negative contraction stress test, you're going to see no late decelerations in the presence of three contractions in 10 minutes. Prognosis is well, fetal well-being, and you may repeat the contraction stress test as needed. If you have a positive CST, then you want to re then you, this shows repetitive late decelerations following over 50% of contractions. Prognosis, worrisome, especially if non-reactive, non-stress test. Hospitalization is the management for prolonged fetal monitoring and delivery. 
Group B strep screening. Group B strep frequently colonizes the female reproductive tract and upper respiratory tracts of young infants. This is strep agalactae. Vertical transmission of the group B streptococcus infection during labor is the leading cause of neonatal infection and a major cause of sepsis in newborns. Complications of GBS infection for maternal chorioamnionitis, preterm labor, asymptomatic bacteria, cystitis, and pilo. Neonates complications, they may have early postpartum infection like meningitis, septic arthritis, or osteomyelitis. For screening, rectovaginal screening culture. The new ACOG guidelines is now recommended at 3607 to 3767 weeks of gestation, previously 35 to 37, with two following exceptions. Exceptions to screening. One, women with bacteria during the current pregnancy, and two, women who previously gave birth to an infant with invasive GBS disease. Women who, who fit either criteria should receive intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis. Intrapartum prophylaxis. If positive screening or one of two exceptions, prophylactic antibiotics given during labor, most effective within four hours of delivery, this is IV penicillin G is the first line agent, 5 million units followed by 2.5 million every four hours after delivery. Second line, ampicillin, extended spectrum penicillins, cephalosporins, clinda, and IV vancomycin. Next, toxic shock syndrome. These are exotoxins produced by Staph aureus. Pathophys, toxic shock syndrome is toxin Toxic shock, syndrome. <laughs> toxic shock syndrome toxin is a super antigen that activates a large number of T cells, which releases various inflammatory mediators like IL-2, IL-1, TNF. This causes capillary leakage, circulatory collapse, and multi-organ failure, similar to SIRS. Risk factors, 50% associated with high absorbency tampon use, non-menstrual, surgical and postpartum wound infections, burns, and contraceptive sponge use. Clinical manifestations, sudden onset of high fever, over 39 or over 102.2, tachycardia, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, pharyngitis. Skin, you may see erythroderma, which is diffuse erythematous macular rash, resembles a sunburn, includes palms and soles. You may also see desquamation. Multisystemic involvement, can manifest as hypotension, abdominal tenderness, headaches, and myalgias. For a diagnosis, clinical, CBC, cultures, management, supportive, hospital admission, removal of offending object, aggressive IV fluid replacement, and antibiotics like Clinda for anaerobes and vancomycin or linazolid for MRSA. Next, RH alloimmunization. The pathophysiology is it occurs when a RHD negative woman carries a RHD positive fetus with exposure to fetal blood mixing of D positive red blood cells during C-section, abruptio placentae, placenta previa, amniocentesis, or vaginal delivery. The mixing causes maternal alloimmunization and maternal anti- RH IgG antibodies against these. During subsequent pregnancies, if she carries another RHD positive fetus, the antibodies may cross the placenta and attack the fetal red blood cells, leading to hemolysis of the fetal red blood cells, a hemolytic disease of the fetus or newborn. If the mother of the fetus is RH negative and father of the fetus is RH positive, there's a 50% chance the baby will be positive. So at-risk pregnancy is an RHD negative mother plus an RHD positive father or unknown. So the workup for this is antibody screen done at the initial prenatal visit to see if the mother is RHD negative or RHD positive. In D negative women, the antibody screen may be repeated at 28 weeks of gestation and at delivery. 
So 0, 28, and delivery if negative. <laughs> Antibody titers. Performed in RHD negative women. Unsensitized equals no RHD antibodies present. If sensitized RHD antibodies are present, titers should be performed via indirect antiglobulin test. A patient is considered sensitized if their titer level is over 1 to 4. If the titer is under 1 to 16, no further treatment is necessary. If antibody titer is 1 to 16 or greater, do amniocentesis at 16 to 20 weeks. If fetal cells are RHD negative, treat like a normal pregnancy. If fetal cells are RHD positive and bilirubin is low, repeat amniocentesis in two to three weeks. If the bilirubin is medium, repeat amniocentesis in one to two weeks. If the bilirubin is high, perform a percutaneous umbilical blood sample, a fetal hematocrit. If fetal hematocrit is low, perform an intrauterine umbilical vein infusion for the fetus. Prevention, in RHD negative women or antibody negative women, you wanna give anti-D RH immunoglobulin, Rogam, 300 micrograms, given in three instances, given at 28 weeks gestation and within 72 hours of delivery of an RHD positive baby and after any potential mixing of blood, like a spontaneous abortion, ectopic pregnancy, amniocentesis, etc. Next, placenta previa. Abnormal placenta placement over or close to the cerv internal cervical os. Types, a complete is complete coverage of the cervical os by the placenta. Partial, partial coverage of the cervical os by the placenta. Marginal, adjacent to the internal os. Leading edge of the placenta is less than two centimeters from the internal os. Risk factors, major risk factors, previous placenta previa, previous C-section, and multiple gestations. Increased age and previous uterine surgery. Clinical manifestations, sudden onset of painless vaginal bleeding in the third trimester. Maybe bright red usually after 28 weeks. Placenta has been there for a while, non-painful, but now bright red blood due to the third trimester. The absence of abdominal pain or uterine tenderness. Physical exam, a soft non-tender uterus. But note, do not perform digital, vaginal, or speculum exam if placenta previa is suspected. May cause increased separation, resulting in severe hemorrhage. Transabdominal ultrasound, often performed initially, screening, with confirmation by transvaginal ultrasound. More sensitive, helps monitor placement of the placenta. Management, stabilization with premature fetus. Watchful waiting if the patient is stable. Pelvic rest, no vaginal intercourse. Delivery when stable. If LS ratio is over 2 to 1, over 36 weeks, and blood loss is over 500 milliliters, they have coagulation defects or persistent labor, a C-section is usually preferred in complete major degrees with fetal distress. Vaginal delivery may be an option if the margins are at least 2 centimeters away from the internal os. Mild degrees and no fetal distress. If there's a chance the placenta is far enough away from the os, don't interfere. Abruptio placentae. Partial or, in, partial or complete premature separation of the placenta from the uterine wall prior to delivery of the fetus. The blood may be concealed within the uterine cavity or external. Blood drains through the cervix. Pathophys, rupture of maternal blood vessels in the decidua basalis, leading to bleeding in into the separated space. The subsequent release of tissue factor, throm thrombin generation, leads to other findings. Risk factors. Maternal hypertension is most common. Chronic preeclampsia, eclampsia. Prior abrupt 
prior abruption, smoking, alcohol use, cocaine, importantly, folate deficiency, advanced maternal age, abdominal trauma, multiple gestations, premature rupture of membranes, and chorioamnionitis, more common in African Americans. Clinical manifestation, sudden onset of painful third trimester vaginal bleeding, often dark red, clots in the uterine wall. Severe abdominal pain, uterine contractions. May have back pain or signs of shock from blood loss. Premature delivery may occur. Physical exam, tender, rigid, hypertonic uterus, blood pooling. Do not perform a pelvic exam. Fetal distress may occur, fetal bradycardia. On diagnosis, it's primary clinical diagnosis. Transabdominal ultrasound may show a retroplacental clot but not reliable, may be helpful to distinguish between, between abruptio and previa. For exam tip, placenta previa versus abruptio placentae, both are common causes of third trimester bleeding. Previa is painless vaginal bleeding plus a soft non-tender uterus, whereas abruptio is painful vaginal bleeding, abdominal pain plus a firm tender uterus, Think previa is painless, whereas abruptio is associated with abdominal pain. We also have vasa previa. Fetal vessels are present in this, I mean, over the cervical os. Fetal mortality approaches 60% if not detected before delivery due to fetal exsanguination. Clinical manifestations, a triad of rupture of membranes, followed by painless vaginal bleeding, plus fetal distress, such as bradycardia. So basically, blood flow is kinked off and can't get to the fetus. Diagnosis may be seen prior to delivery as the vessels crosses the os. Management, immediate C-section. Next, chronic pre-existing hypertension. Hypertension of 140 over 90 or greater, occurring before 20 weeks gestation or prior to pregnancy. Mild, 140 over 90 or greater. Moderate, 150 over 100 or greater. Severe, 160 over 110 or greater. Manifestations, usually asymptomatic, but headache or visual symptoms may be seen if severe, such as over 160 over 110. Management of mild, monitor every two to three weeks. Weekly, between 34 to 36 weeks. Delivery may be recommended at 37 weeks or later. Management of moderate to severe. Medications, labetalol, long-acting calcium channel blockers like nifedipine, or methyl dopa are first-line agents, also hydralazine. Management of blood pressure to help reduce maternal and fetal complications. ACE inhibitors and ARBs are contraindicated. And remember the mnemonic, mothers love healthy newborns, methyl dopa, labetalol, hydralazine, and nifedipine. Transitional hypertension aka gestational hypertension or pregnancy-induced hypertension. New onset of hypertension, 140 over 90 or greater, occurring after 20 weeks gestation, plus no proteinuria, no edema, or end organ dysfunction is transitional. Clinical manifestations, asymptomatic. Diagnostic workup, primarily to distinguish gestational from preeclampsia. You get a urine protein, platelets, LFTs, and assessment of fetal status. Remember, you want to rule out HELP syndrome as well in preeclampsia. So you get a CBC, urinalysis, LFTs, and blood pressure checks. Management is supportive monitoring. Again, weekly blood pressure, urine protein, platelets, and liver enzymes. Ultrasound monthly to check for intrauterine growth restriction and weekly fetal non-stress testing in the third trimester. If they have severe hypertension of over 160 over 110 or greater, blood pressure medication only during pregnancy to reduce stroke risk, methyl dopa, labetalol, and nifedipine. You can also use hydralazine. Preeclampsia. This is a new onset of hypertension, systolic over 140 over 90 or greater, occurring after 20 weeks of gestation, plus proteinuria or end organ dysfunction in a previously normotensive female. Blood pressure measurements done at least two on at least two occasions, at least four hours apart. Risk factors, pre-existing hypertension, nulliparity, maternal age under 20 or over 35, 
diabetics, CKD, autoimmune disorders. Also a new father as well. If you have the same father, that could be protective factor. Mild preeclampsia, blood pressure 140 over 90 or greater, plus a protein urea of at least 300 milligrams in a 24-hour urine specimen or a dipstick 1 plus to 2 plus. Severe features would be a BP of 160 over 110 or greater, plus protein urea at least 5 grams in 24-hour urine specimen or a dipstick of 3 plus or greater. Symptoms of end organ damage, cerebral or visual symptoms, such as a new onset or persistent headaches, flashing lights, blurred vision, altered mental status, severe or persistent epigastric or right upper quadrant pain, DIC, or pulmonary or peripheral edema. There could also be progressive renal insufficiency, like a serum creatinine of over 1.1 or oliguria under 500 milliliters of urine in 24 hours or under 30 cc's per hour, thrombocytopenia, or HELP syndrome, hemolytic anemia, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelets, so thrombocytopenia and transaminitis. Management of mild preeclampsia, 37 weeks of gestation or greater is managed with delivery. Under 37 weeks, you need to expect it management, daily weights, weekly blood pressure and dipstick, bed rest, antenatal corticosteroids to mature lungs if elective delivery is planned with delivery at 37 weeks gestation, and that's betamethasone. Management of severe features, 37 weeks or greater, prompt delivery definitive management after hospitalization, plus magnesium sulfate to prevent seizures, plus blood pressure control, labetalol, nifedipine, methyl dopa, hydralazine, 34 to 37 weeks, prompt delivery is the definitive management. And if they're viable, 33 plus 6 weeks, if symptomatic, not controlled with antihypertensives, deliver. If asymptomatic or well controlled with antihypertensives, do expectant management followed by delivery at 34. Next, eclampsia. This is preeclampsia plus seizures or coma. Abrupt onset of tonic-clonic seizures. Management, IV mag sulf, four seizures and blood pressure stabilization, followed by delivery of the fetus, once the mother is stabilized. Lorazepam, only used if refractory to magnesium sulfate. And blood pressure control, IV labetalol or hydralazine, IV nicardipine. Next, gestational diabetes mellitus. Glucose intolerance or diabetes only present during pregnancy, usually subsides postpartum. Risk factors, family or prior history of gestational diabetes, spontaneous abortion, history of infant over 4,000 grams at birth, and multiple gestations. Also risk factor of obesity and over 25 years of age. Non-Caucasians, African Americans the highest, pathophysiology, Maternal insulin resistance in women with undiagnosed beta cell dysfunction exacerbated by placental re release of diabetogenic hormones like HPL, human placental lactogen, human somatomammotropin, growth hormone, and corticotropin releasing hormone. Maternal insulin resistance allows for increased glucose availability for the growing fetus. Thus, if they had prior insulin resistance underlying, this will be exacerbated. So fetal complications. Fetal hyperinsulinemia leads to fetal macrosomia most commonly. Birth injuries from macrosomia, like shoulder dystocia coming out, preterm labor, delayed fetal lung maturity, fetal hyperglycemia, but neonatal hypoglycemia due to high fetal insulin levels plus an abrupt removal of maternal glucose after delivery. Once again, neonatal hypoglycemia, hypocalcemia, hypomagnesemia, and hyperbilirubinemia. Congenital malformations like cardiac, MSK, and CNS occur less because gestational diabetes occurs later in pregnancy, so unlikely to have cardiac, MSK, or CNS problems. Maternal complications, over 50% chance of developing type 2 after pregnancy over 50% chance of recurrence with subsequent pregnancies, 
and preeclampsia and abruptio placentae are more common too. So for screening of gestational diabetes, you can do a two-step approach. Step one is a 50-gram, one-hour glucose challenge test. This is done at 24 to 28 weeks. Screens positive if glucose is over 130, go on to a three-hour glucose tolerance test. So step two, the three-hour is a 100-gram, three-hour oral glucose tolerance test. And this is the diagnostic gold standard. The threshold for glucose levels on a three-hour glucose tolerance test are two of the four. Fasting over 95, one hour over 180, two hours over 155, three hours over 140. So with this step two, 100 gram for three hours, you want to see that any of the things are positive if they're fasting over 95, if in one hour they're over 180, two hours, 155, three hours over 140. You can also do a screening, such as an alternative one-step approach, which is a 75-gram, two-hour glucose tolerance test, which may be more sensitive. Management, lifestyle modifications, diabetic diet and exercise, such as walking, are the initial treatments of choice. Note that pregnant patients are not told to lose weight. Daily finger sticks, overnight and after each meal. <coughs> Medical management, indications, if they have two of those four, so fasting over 95 or greater, and a one hour postprandial from that 50, um, 50 gram challenge of over 130 after a trial of diet and exercise. Insulin, first line medical treatment, does not does not cross the placenta. Goal of treatment is fasting glucose under 95. Gliburide or metformin are also relatively safe in women who are unable to comply or refuse insulin therapy, although insulin's first line. Can also do labor induction at 38 weeks if uncontrolled or macrosomic, at 40 weeks if uncontrolled and no macrosomia as well. C-section may be delivery method of choice if the child is macrosomic. Pre-gestational diabetes, pre-existing type 1 or type 2 prior to pregnancy. Complications include preeclampsia, spontaneous abortion, postpartum hemorrhage, fetal complications, congenital anomalies, cardiac, neural tube defects, macrosomia, preterm labor. Next, shoulder dystocia. Failure of the shoulders to spontaneously traverse the pelvis after delivery of the fetal head due to impaction. Anterior shoulder is stuck behind the mother's pubic bone. Considered an obstetric emergency. Risk factors. Most commonly seen in macrosomic infants of diabetics, post-term delivery, multiparity, prolonged second stage of labor, forceps delivery, maternal obesity, advanced maternal age, and epidural anesthesia. Fetal complications, brachial plexus injuries due to traction during shoulder dystocia, herbs palsy, which is like the waiter's tip, clump key paralysis, and cerebral palsy. Also, the herb Duchenne palsy, which we said, is a lesion of the upper trunk root, injury to C5, C6, with or without C7, of the brachial plexus, leading to the characteristic waiter's tip deformity. The arm is in adduction with the elbows in extension, forearm pronation, and wrist flexion with the fingers curled up. You can also have clavicular fractures, long bone fractures, fetal asphyxia, anoxic brain injury, maternal complications, perineal or vaginal tears, postpartum hemorrhage, uterine rupture, clinical manifestations. During delivery, the turtle sign may occur. This is retraction of the baby's head, similar to a turtle retracting into its shell, or a red puffy face. For management, non-manipulative, such as the Mick Roberts maneuver, which the uh, mom will have hyperflexion and abduction of the hips towards the abdomen without and then with suprapubic pressure. An extended episiotomy may be needed to be performed. There's also manipulative management, delivery of the posterior arm to allow for rotational maneuvers like the Woods, the Rubin 1 and Rubin 2 maneuvers, or the Woods corkscrew maneuver which is rotation of the fetal shoulders 180 degrees. 
So you basically put the shoulder that was at the pubic symphysis, you put it completely posterior. Others, the Gaskin all four maneuver and the Zavanelli maneuver, which is pushing the fetal head back into the vaginal canal with immediate transport to C-section. So Z at the end of the alphabet means this is a last resort and done to go to emergency C-section, the Zavanelli maneuver. Prevention. Caesarean section, ces yeah, delivery indicated if fetus is over 4,500 grams in weight with a diabetic mother or over 5,000 in a non-diabetic mother. Next, breech presentation. The fetus whose pre presenting part is the buttocks or the feet occurs in 3 to 5% of fetuses born at term 37 to 40 weeks. Risks of breech presentation include developmental dysplasia of the hips, torticollis, and mild deformations. Spontaneous version may occur at any time prior to delivery. Types of frank breech are both hips are flexed and both knees are extended. The feet are adjacent to the fetal head. Most common type of breech presentation at term, 50 to 70 percent. Or it could be a complete breech. Both the hips and both knees are flexed, 5 to 10 percent. Incomplete, one or both of the hips are not completely flexed, 10 to 40 percent. Diagnosis by physical exam. A soft mass, the buttocks, instead of the normal hard surface of the skull. Leopold maneuvers are a set of four maneuvers that can determine the estimated fetal weight and presenting part of the fetus. Ultrasound can be used to confirm the diagnosis if it's uncertain. Management, choice of delivery route includes patient preference, expertise, and some of the options include the external cephalic version before labor, followed by a trial of labor if the version is successful, and cesarean delivery if version is unsuccessful is an option for women at or near term at a low risk of labor and delivery related complications. Planned C-section of the breech fetus, if the breech persists, reduces maternal and perinatal death. You can also do the ex uh, external cephalic version before labor, followed by a trial of labor if the version is successful. Also a planned cesarean delivery for breech presentation without a trial of external cephalic version or a trial of labor and vaginal breech birth for patients thought to be at a low risk of delivery related complications without a trial of external cephalic version. Next, umbilical cord prolapse. Occurs when the cord extends past the presenting part of the fetus and protrudes into the vagina. A prolapsed cord can lead to reduced fetal oxygenation as a result of umbilical artery vasospasm and umbilical vein occlusion similar to a vasoprevia. Risk factors. Fetal and maternal factors include low birth weight, malpresentation, long umbilical cord, pelvic deformities, low-lying placentation, polyhydramnios, prematurity. Manifestations of umbilical cord prolapse, sudden onset of severe, prolonged fetal bradycardia or variable decelerations after a previous normal tracing. So decelerations of the O2 saturation show the cord might be cut off. The cord may be palpable on vaginal exam. Management, emergent C-section -se to avoid fetal compromise or death. Pre-op intrauterine resuscitation aims to increase oxygen delivery to the placenta and umbilical blood flow. Manual elevation of the fetal presenting part to prevent compression. Placing the patient in Trendelenburg or knee-to-chest position or tocolytics as well. Vaginal delivery is an option when the delivery is impending and can be securely assisted. Next, C-section, cesarean delivery, the use of surgery for delivery of the fetus. Indications, conditions where vaginal delivery would put the fetus or mother at risk. Includes but not limited to failure to progress during labor, which is the most common, as well as non-reassuring fetal status, fetal malpresentation, problems with the placenta or umbilical cord, multiple gestations, maternal hypertension, 
maternal infection with a significant risk of perinatal transmission via vaginal birth, suspected macrosomia, or uterine rupture. Timing. Scheduled primary C-section at term is often performed in the 39th or 40th week of gestation. Obstetrically and medically indicated C uh, cesarean deliveries are performed as deemed necessary. The timing of an elective repeat C-section delivery is dependent on a multitude of factors. Antibiotic prophylaxis for C-section, you want to do preoperative up to 60 minutes prior to making the initial incision, and this is IV cefazolin. You might do azithromycin in C-section um, after rupture of membranes or interpartum. Clinda or Gent if penicillin allergic. For women in labor and women with ruptured membranes, vaginal cleansing before cesarean delivery with povidone iodine vaginal scrub reduces the frequency of postpartum endometritis. Thromboprophylaxis. For all women undergoing C-section, mechanical thromboprophylaxis is suggested. Women at higher risk of VTE should receive mechanical thromboprophylaxis plus pharmacologic thromboprophylaxis. Pharmacologic prophylaxis is initiated 6 to 12 hours post-op after concerns for hemorrhage are diminished and continued until the woman is fully ambulating. Next, morning sickness and hyperemesis gravidarum. Morning sickness, nausea and or vomiting up until 16 weeks most common in the first trimester. Hyperemesis gravidarum, severe, excessive form of morning sickness, nausea and vomiting, associated with weight loss and electrolyte imbalance, developing during the first or second trimester. If it's hyperemesis, it persists over 16 weeks of gestation, and they might have a metabolic ALK. Clinical manifestations, nausea and vomiting. Hyperemesis gravidarum is associated with more severe symptoms, weight loss of 5%, and pre-pregnant weight and acidosis from starvation. Ketosis, if severe, leads to metabolic acidosis. Risk factors, prima gravida, previous hyperemesis in the past pregnancy, multiple gestations or molar pregnancy, pathophysiology, vomiting center, oversensitivity to hormones of pregnancy like beta-HCG, which is way more increased in the first trimester. Labs in uh, hyperemesis gravidarum, electrolyte imbalances, hypokalemia, hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis from the vomiting, and ketones. Management, lifestyle modifications are first. You want to use ginger, dietary changes like high-protein foods, small and frequent meals, avoid triggering foods such as spicy or fatty, and also increased fluids. You can use pyridoxine, vitamin B6, with or without doxalamine, first-line medical management. Second line, if no relief, use antihistamines, doxalamine, diphenhydramine, meclizine. Third line, dopamine antagonists, metoclopramide, promethazine. Fourth line, odansetron. And then also to manage the hypovolemia, you want to do IV fluids, electrolytes. Uterine rupture is next. Complete transection of the uterus from the endometrium to the serosa. If the peritoneum remains intact, it is known as a uterine dehiscence. Most occur during labor at the site of a previous C-section. This could be a life-threatening to the mother and the fetus. For risk factors, previous uterine rupture, prior C-section, or fundal or vertical. Induction of labor, trauma, especially in MVA, uterine myomectomy, uterine overdistension, like multiple gestation, polyhydramnios, also placenta, percreta, abdominal trauma. A decreased risk, a prior vaginal delivery, either before or after the prior C-section, significantly reduces rupture risk. For clinical manifestations, sudden onset of extreme abdominal pain in uterine rupture, decreased or absent uterine contractions, abnormal bump in the abdomen, and possible regression of the fetus. Vaginal hemorrhaging, the most common fetal heart rate pattern is fetal bradycardia. No fetal heart rate pattern is pathognomonic. High fetal heart rate, 50 to 75%, depending on if the placenta remains attached to the uterine wall or not. Management, immediate laparotomy and delivery of the fetus, 
to reduce fetal and maternal mortality, followed by repair of the uterus or hysterectomy. If repair is performed, all subsequent pre uh, pregnancies must be delivered cesarean at 36 weeks. Next, moving into labor and delivery. Intrapartum first, Braxton Hicks contractions, spontaneous uterine contractions late in pregnancy, not associated with cervical dilation. Uterus training, basically. Uterus is practicing its contractions. Lightening, the fetal head descends into the pelvis, causing a change in the abdomen's shape and sensation that the baby has become lighter. Ruptured membranes, a sudden gush of liquid or constant leaking of the fluid. Bloody show, passage of blood-tinged cervical mucus late in pregnancy. Occurs when the cervix begins thinning. Effacement. True labor. Contractions of the uterus fundus with radiation to the lower back and abdomen. Lower back and abdomen that are regular and painful contractions of the uterus causing cervical dilation and fetus expulsion is true labor. Next, the cardinal movements of labor. First, engagement. When the fetal presenting part enters the pelvic inlet. Descent, passage of the fetal head into the pelvis, commonly called lightening. Flexion, flexion of the head to allow the smallest diameter to present to the pelvis. Internal rotation, fetal vertex moves from the occiput transverse position into a position where the sagittal suture is parallel to the anterior posterior diameter of the pelvis. Extension, vertex extends as it passes beneath the pubic symphysis. External rotation, fetus externally rotates after the head is delivered so that the shoulder can be delivered. And then expulsion. Next, the stages of uh, labor. There's three stages of labor. Stage one, onset of labor, true regular contractions to full dilation of the cervix, 10 centimeters. In this stage one, there's a latent and active. The latent is cervix effacement with gradual cervix dilation, has to efface first. Active phase, rapid cervical dilation, usually beginning at three to four centimeters. Next, stage two labor. This is the time from full cervical dilation until delivery of the fetus. Once again, a passive and an active phase. The passive phase of this stage two labor is complete cervical dilation to active maternal expulsion efforts. Active phase from active maternal expulsion efforts to delivery of the fetus. Stage three, postpartum until delivery of the placenta. Zero to 30 minutes, usually an average of five. Three signs of placental separation. A gush of blood, lengthening of the umbilical cord, and the anterior cephalad movement of the uterine fundus becomes globular and firmer as the placenta detaches. Placental expulsion, due to downward pressure of the retroplacental hematoma, uterine contractions. The period of one to two hours after delivery where the mother is assessed for complications is sometimes called the fourth stage. Pre-labor -pre rupture of membranes, PROM, Rupture of the amniotic membranes before the onset of labor. If it occurs prior to 37 weeks gestation, it is known as preterm pre-labor rupture of membranes, PPROM, under 37 weeks. Complications may lead to chorioamnionitis or endometritis if prolonged over 24 hours, cord prolapse, placental abruption, risk factors, STIs, smoking, prior preterm delivery, as well as multiple gestations. Clinical manifestations, a gush of fluid or persistent leak of fluid from the va vagina or vaginal discharge. Diagnosis, sterile speculum exam, pooling of secretions in the posterior fornix with inspection. Obtain fluid from cultures, nitrosine paper test or fern test. Nitrosine paper test. Turns blue if the pH is over 6.5. Premature rupture of membranes is likely because normal amniotic fluid pH is around 7 compared to the vaginal pH around 4. The fern test, amniotic fluid dries in the pattern of a fern, 
which is crystallization of estrogen and amniotic fluid. Again, the nitrosine paper test turns the pH over 6.5. Ultrasound to check amniotic fluid index. Avoid digital vaginal examination unless delivery is imminent in most cases to avoid introduction of infection. Management expectant. Admit with fetal monitoring and await spontaneous delivery. 90% will go into spontaneous labor within 24 hours after premature rupture of membranes. Monitor for infection, chorioamnionitis or endometritis. Labor induction, if chorioamnionitis or labor does not occur spontaneously within 18 hours or rupture. Prostaglandin cervical gel or oxytocin. Preterm pre-labor rupture of membranes, PPROM. Rupture of the amniotic membranes before the onset of labor, occurring prior to 37 weeks. Complications may lead to chorioamnionitis or endometritis if prolonged over one day, cord prolapse as well, and placental abruption. STIs, smoking, preterm labor, multiple gestations. Management expectant. If no signs of maternal or fetal infection or distress, admit with fetal monitor and await for spontaneous delivery. If under 34 weeks, administer corticosteroids, betamethasone, to enhance fetal lung maturity. That's under 34 weeks. Amniocentesis can be done to assess fetal lung maturity. Tocolytics may be given to delay delivery 48 hours to allow betamethasone to work if not in advanced labor over 4 centimeters dilation would be advanced labor, no signs of chorioamnionitis, or if no signs of non-reassuring fetal testing. Antibiotics, such as ampicillin and azithromycin, are often given to prevent infection. Prompt delivery, if signs of maternal or fetal infection or distress. Preterm, preterm pre-labor, next. Labor equals regular uterine contractions over four to six per hour, plus progressive cervical effacement and dilation between 20 to 36 weeks gestation. Clinical manifestations, contractions, abdominal pain, pelvic pain, or lower back pain. Diagnosis, preterm labor is cervical dilation three centimeters or greater, plus over 80% effacement or the presence of fetal fibronectin between 20 to 34 weeks. PTL, preterm labor, likely if cervical dilation two to three centimeters with under 80% effacement, or if over one centimeter cervical dilation between serial examinations. Signs of rupture of membranes include pooling of the fluid in the vaginal fornix, positive ferning of vaginal fluid, and nitrosine paper turning blue. For the workup, rule out infections, such as UTI, GBS, STIs, amniocentesis for LS ratio, an LS ratio under 2.0 suggests fetal lung immaturity. So over 2 to 1 LS ratio means the lungs are mature. This is lungs to surfactant ratio. Management of 34 weeks or later and fetal weight is over 2,500 grams. Admit for delivery. If at four to six hours there is no progression, progressive cervical dilation or effacement, plus fetal well-being is determined, reactive non-stress test, they are eligible for discharge home. Management under 34 weeks, plus 600, minus 2,500 grams. Delay delivery with tocolytics, plus betamethasone to enhance fetal lung maturity. Corticosteroids. Decreased incidence of infant respiratory distress syndrome and neonatal mortality. It only takes two days for betamethasone to work. Tocolytics may be given to delay labor up to 48 hours to allow for betamethasone to take full effects. This effects begin at 24 hours and peak at 48 hours and last seven days. Also, magnesium sulfate exposure in utero confers neuroprotection against severe motor dysfunction and cerebral palsy in preterm births. Antibiotics for GBS as well in the management of under 34 weeks old preterm labor with ampicillin for GBS. So magnesium sulfate does a few things. Tocolytic, 
neuroprotective in cerebral palsy and motor dysfunction, and also, of course, an anti-seizure med. Next, postpartum depression. This is major depression two weeks to 12 months postpartum. So the differentiating between postpartum blues, postpartum depression, and psychosis. Postpartum blues will be two to four days postpartum. This will be a mild depression with insomnia, anhedonia, fatigue, depressed mood, irritability. They'll have concerns if she is a good mother. No thoughts of harming the baby, though, and resolves within one to two weeks. No treatment is needed, maybe some CBT. Moving to postpartum depression, this is two weeks to two months postpartum, and you have those symptoms again, irritability, sleep and mood disturbances, loss of interest, anhedonia, eating changes, and crying most days of the week may have thoughts of harming baby. Resolves within three to 14 months. You want to give SSRI and CBT. And then rarely is postpartum psychosis, which is an onset of repeat weekly or biweekly. And, and for this, they have psychotic thoughts and delusions, thoughts of harming the baby. Baby is in danger. Admit the patient and remove child to ensure their safety. They need SSRIs, antipsychotics, CBT. Next, induction of labor. Stimulation of uterine contractions to initiate labor prior to the onset of spontaneous labor. Indications, vaginal delivery, when prolonged labor may lead to complications for either the mother or the fetus, and for those risks are greater than continuing the pregnancy. Contraindications to induction of labor. Situations in which the risk of induction of vaginal delivery is greater than C-section. Absolute contraindications, such as a transmural myomectomy, placenta previa, a prolapsed cord, active genital herpes, transverse fetal lie, uterine scar from a classical C-section incision, and a cephalopelvic disproportion. So those are absolute contraindications to induction of labor. Also some relative contraindications to induction. Breach presentation, multiple gestations, prematurity, and previous C-section with a transverse scar. Remember, a classical C-section incision is an absolute, where a relative is in a uh, transverse scar. Early induction, used in women with unfavorable cervices to promote cervical ripening. Prostaglandin gel placed directly on the cervix promotes cervical ripening and may lead to uterine contractions. So this is why misoprostol is used in abortion. It's the same mechanism. Also, balloon catheter or Laminaria dilates the cervix. Later induction performed when the cervix is dilated under one centimeter with some effacement, however. IV oxytocin, pitocin, is a uterotonic agent. Monitor uterine activity and fetal heart rate. Amniotomy, an artificial rupture of membranes with a small hook, may be performed if the cervix is partially dilated and there is effacement of the cervix. Next is APGAR score, usually done at 1 and 5 minutes after birth, repeated at 10 minutes if abnormal. Score from 1 to 10. Over 7 is normal, 4 to 6 is fairly low, under 3 is critically low. So it stands for appearance, pulse, grimace, activity, and respiration. And it can be scored as 0, 1, or 2 for each of those. So first for appearance, you want to look for skin color changes. Zero is a blue-gray, pale all over. One is acrocyanosis, but the body is still pink, just blue extremities. And two is a pink baby with no cyanosis. For pulse, zero is zero. One is under 100, and two points is over 100. Grimace, reflex irritability. Zero is no response to stimulation. One is grimaces feebly. Two is pulls away, sneezes, or coughs. Activity, muscle tone. Zero is none. One is some flexion. Two is flexes arms and legs and resists extension. Respiration. Zero, absent. One, weak and irregular. Two, strong, crying, normal, 30 to 60 per minute. Next, postpartum period. Perperium, six-week period after delivery. 
the uterus. At the level of the umbilicus after delivery, involution shrinks after two days, descends into the pelvic cavity around two weeks, the normal size around six weeks postpartum. Lochia serosa, purple or pinkish, brown, vaginal bleeding, especially postpartum days four to ten from the decidua tissue, usually resolves three to four weeks postpartum. Breasts and menstruation. Breast milk in the postpartum day three to five is bluish white. If lactating, mothers may remain anovulatory during this time. Pro prolactin inhibits the cycle. If not breastfeeding, menses may return six to eight weeks postpartum. Postpartum hemorrhage. Bleeding over 500 milliliters if vaginal delivery is performed, or over 1,000 milliliters if C-section is performed. Loss requires transfusion or a 10% decrease in hematocrit. Common cause of maternal death within 24 hours of delivery is a postpartum hemorrhage. Early, within 24 hours postpartum. Delayed, over 24 hours up to 8 weeks postpartum. And the etiologies of postpartum hemorrhage. Uterine atony is the most common cause at 80%. The uterus is unable to contract to stop the bleeding. Also tissue, retained placental tissue, trauma to the cervix, perineum or, va or vagina, <laughs> vagina, uterine rupture or lacerations, thrombin, anticoagulation, abnormalities, hemophilia A, von Willebrand's disease, ITP or DIC. And those are your four T's, tone, uterine atony, tissue, trauma, and thrombin. Thrombin is the coagulation abnormalities. So risk factors for uterine atony, um, rapid or prolonged labor, overdistended uterus, C-section, anesthesia, or retained placenta, clinical manifestations, prolonged bleeding, hypovolemic shock, hypotension, tacky, pale or clammy skin, decreased capillary refill, physical exam, a soft, flaccid, boggy uterus, uterine atony, with dilated cervix, workup, CBC to evaluate H and H, IV access, ultrasound may detect the bleeding source or retain POC, management of the atony, bimanual uterine massage and compression is the first line treatment. Also, uterotonic agents like IV oxytocin is the first line medical management to increase uterine contractions. If oxytocin is ineffective, methyl organovine if no hypertension, coronary or cerebral artery disease, or prostaglandin analogs can be used. IM, carboprost, if no asthma, or misoprostol. For refractory, tamponade, surgical ligation of the uterine artery, arterial embolization, or hysterectomy. Management due to retained products, suction and curatage may be needed. Management of uterine inversion, Manual reposition of the uterus. Elevate the posterior fornix is the initial management plus discontinuation of uterotonic agents. Suspect if a red mass protrudes from the vagina. Uterine relaxing agents, nitro, terbutaline, magnesium sulfate. Next, we'll go to ectopic pregnancy. Implantation of the fertilized ovum outside the uterine cavity. Locations of the ectopic, ampulla of the fallopian tube is the most common, 98%. Could also be the abdomen, ovary, and cervix as well. For high risk, previous ectopic is the strongest risk factor. History of PID as well, one of the most common. IUD use as well. Previous abdominal or tubal surgery due to adhesions. History of tubal ligation, endometriosis, and assisted reproduction like IVF. So don't forget IUDs, previous history of an ectopic, and PID. Clinical manifestations. The classic triad of unilateral pelvic and lower abdominal pain, plus vaginal bleeding, plus amenorrhea, such as pregnancy. This triad is also seen with a threatened abortion, threatened more common than ectopic, however. It could be an atypical presentation as well, with vague symptoms and menstrual irregularities, but if it's ruptured, you may have severe abdominal as well as left shoulder pain, which is the Kerr sign. Dizziness, nausea, vomiting, peritonitis, 
guarding, rigidity, or rebound tenderness, signs of shock from hemorrhage, syncope, tachycardia, hypotension. Physical exam, there'll be an adnexal mass, cervical motion tenderness. Diagnosis, quantitative beta HCG, confirms the pregnancy. Beta HCG should double every 48 to 72 hours. In an ectopic, serial beta HCG falls in falls to double, oh, fails to double, rises under 66% expected, decreases or plateaus. If the initial value is under 1500, then repeat every two to three days. So it's much lower than expected in ectopic than normally would be. Transvaginal ultrasound, absence of gestational sac with a beta HCG level over 2000 strongly suggests ectopic or non-viable intrauterine pregnancy. So an increase, but no, nothing seen on transvaginal ultrasound. Other is a caldocentesis, non-clotting, non-clotted blood present, not often done. Laparoscopy is not used often. Management of stable or unruptured. Methotrexate destroys trophoblastic tissue. Indications for methotrexate, hemodynamically stable. Patients with early gestation under four centimeters Beta HCG under 5,000 and no fetal tones who will be compliant to follow up and are immunocompetent. So methotrexate, hemodynamically stable, immunocompetent, and compliant to follow up, as well as a beta HCG under 5,000 with no fetal tones. Important indications. Also laparoscopic salpingostomy or salping salpingectomy are alternatives. Rogam given if Rh negative woman. Laparoscopic salpingostomy or salpingectomy are alternatives. Management of unstable or ruptured. Laparoscopic salpingostomy, often surgical procedure of choice when possible, may need re reparative procedure to save reproductive organs, plus IV fluids. Salpingectomy if salpingostomy cannot be performed. Rogam is given to Rh negative women, 300 micrograms. Follow up. Serial beta HCG to see if there is a 15% decrease in 4 to 7 days. HCG followed until it re returns to zero. If methotrexate was given and there is no significant decrease, a, a second dose can be given. If no response to the second dose, surgery should be performed. Contraception should be used for at least two months after an ectopic pregnancy. Next, gestational trophoblastic disease, molar pregnancy. Neoplasm, due to abnormal placental development with trophoblastic tissue proliferation arising from gestational tissue, not maternal in origin, 80% are benign. Complete molar pregnancy is a diploid, 46XX usually, empty, enucleated egg with no DNA that is fertilized by one or two sperm. All paternal chromosomes lead to the absence of fetal tissue. Associated with higher risk of malignant development into choriocarcinoma, 20%. Most common type is this complete. Partial molar pregnancy. Partial is a triploid tissue and not viable. Triploid 69 XXX or XXY. An egg is fertilized by two sperm. Fetal tissue may be seen, but it is usually abnormal and not viable. So for complete, it's diploid and there's no tissue, absence of fetal tissue, and partial, it's triploid and tissue is not viable. It's fertilized by two sperm. Risk factors. Prior molar pregnancy, extremes of age, under 20, over 35, as well as Asian. Clinical manifestations, painless vaginal bleeding, preeclampsia before 20 weeks, and hyperemesis gravidarum due to the elevated beta HCG levels. Physical examination, uterine size and date discrepancies, larger or smaller than expected. Diagnosis, beta HCG, markedly elevated with complete over 100,000. Way too increased is an indicator. Pelvic ultrasound, complete. Central heterogeneous mass with multiple discrete anechoic spaces. 
snowstorm, or cluster of grapes appearance, absence of fetal parts and heart sounds. A partial may have a gestational sac and fetal heart tones, but may be present plus abnormal tissue. Management. Surgical uterine evacuation is the mainstay of treatment as soon as possible to avoid risk of choriocarcinoma development. Patients are followed weekly until the beta-HCG levels fall to an undetectable level. Hysterectomy is also an option. Obtain chest radiographs to look for METs for choriocarcinoma, as the most common area is in the lungs. Next, pruritic urticarial papules and plaques of pregnancy. Common benign self-limiting rash of pregnancy, also known as polymorphic eruption of pregnancy, most commonly occurs in the first pregnancy after 35 weeks or postpartum. Clinical manifestations, extremely pruritic erythematous papules with striae that spread outwards to form urticarial plaques, usually spares the face, palms, and soles. Management is topical corticosteroids to decrease pruritus usually resolve spontaneously by 15 days postpartum. Next, we'll move into contraceptive methods. So first, emergency, postcoital, contraception. In order, to, in order of maximal to minimal efficiency, the copper IUD, Paragard, is the most effective. Second most effective for emergency contraceptive is Eulipristal, which is Ella. Next is levonorgestrel, which is plan B. And last is estrogen progestin. So copper IUD, the most effective method for emergency contraception, if inserted within five to seven days after unprotected intercourse, prevents up to 99% of pregnancies. Eulipristal is the second most effective. Progestin receptor modulated, modulator, that delays ovulation must be taken within five days, 120 hours after intercourse. It is the most effective oral emergency contraceptive. Next, levonorgestrel or the plan B, ideally given within 72 hours or three days after in intercourse, but effective up to five days after intercourse. Mechanism inhibits or delays ovulation, reduces the chance of pregnancy by 75% to 99% preferred over the estrogen and progestin regimen. Common adverse effects are nausea and vomiting. <clears throat> and lastly, for emergency, is the high-dose estrogen and progestin, ideally given within three days of unprotected intercourse. Mechanisms inhibits or delays ovulation. Common adverse effects are nausea and vomiting. Next, we'll move into oral contraceptives, estrogen and progesterone. The mechanism of action prevents ovulation and implantation by inhibiting mid-cycle LH surge, thickening the cervical mucosa, and thins the endometrium. So it does three things. Thicken the cervix, no LH surge, and thick, um, thins the endometrium. Failure rate, average is 9%, but only 0.3% when used correctly. Often started with the onset of menses or within five days after the start of menses. Active, active pills are taken for 21 days, followed by seven days of no pills or placebos. Advantages, improves dysmenorrhea, abnormal uterine bleeding, acne and hirsutism, protects against osteoporosis, ovarian and endometrial cancers, reduces ectopic pregnancy risk, as well as decreases the incidence of ovarian cysts and benign breast diseases. So, B-O-O-D-E-H. Bleeding, osteoporosis, ovarian cysts, dysmenorrhea, endometrial cancer, and hirsutism, and ovarian cancer too with O. And disadvantages are increased hypercoagulability, DVT and PE, gallstone formation, gallstasis, increased fluid retention, increased triglycerides, cholestasis, and diabetes mellitus, increased risk of hepatic adenoma. Contraindications, migraine, breast cancer, hypercoagulability over 35. So MBH over MBH 35. 
history of ischemic heart disease, DVT, PE, or stroke, breast cancer, migraine with aura. Smokers should stop the use of OCPs if 35 years of age or older, especially if smoking 15 cigarettes or more per day due to thrombogenic potential. Severe hypertension, systolic 160, diastolic over 100. Next, progesterone-only pills. Norethindrone mini pill. Mechanism of action. Thickens the cervical mucus, thins the endometrium, and suppresses ovulation via the LH surge. Indications. Woman in whom an estrogen-containing contraceptive is either contraindicated or causes additional health issues, like migraines or women 35 years of age or older who smoke at least 15 cigarettes per day. Progesterone-only pill often initiated on the first day of menses. Backup contraceptive is not necessary if POPs are started within the first five days of the start of menses. Pills must be taken at the same time each day to maximize efficacy. Advantages of progesterone-only pill? No estrogen-related adverse effects, so little effects on coagulation factors, blood pressure, glucose, and lipid levels. Also safe during lactation, reduces the risk of endometrial cancer. Adverse effects, unscheduled bleeding, and changes in menses. Next, the progesterone-only contraceptives. This is norethindrone, the mini pill. Injectable, depo-medroxyprogesterone acetate. 5% average failure and it lasts every three months. This is a very short-term one. Mechanism, suppresses pituitary FSH and LH. Adverse effects, may lead to calcium loss, bone weakness, and osteoporosis. So not usually used for more than two years for the depo-medroxyprogesterone. For the progestin implant, is a failure rate of 0.05, and it lasts three years. This is the implant on in the bicipital groove. Adverse effects include headache and menstrual irregularities. And also we have the intrauterine levonorgestrel, the Mirena. So the Mirena is five, the Kylina is five, the Skyla is three years. Good for use of five years. In induces inflammation, leading to a hostile environment to a fertilized ovum. Usually inserted during menses, to ensure the patient is not pregnant. Adverse effects, uterine perforation, increased risk of ectopic pregnancy and PID, cramping or bleeding with menses, risk of spontaneous abortion if pregnancy occurs. Next, the copper IUD, Paragard, mechanism of action, causes inflammation that makes a hostile environment for sperm and ova, 0.8% average failure rate. Advantages, 10-year duration of action, very effective contraceptive method, no exogenous hormones. The copper IUD does not cause anovulation or amenorrhea. Patients continue to have cyclic bleeding and less unscheduled bleeding compared to live in a gestural IUD. It can be used for emergency contraceptive and left in place for ongoing. Adverse effects, increased risk of PID. Next, some other drugs of women's health are clomiphene citrate, also called Clomid, facilitates the FSH and LH surge. The mechanism is a partial estrogen receptor agonist that stimulates ovulation via the hypothalamus, leading to increased LH and FSH release. Indications, induces ovulation to enhance fertility, especially in patients with PCOS, infertility due to anovulation. Adverse effects, hot flash is most common, ovarian enlargement, multiple gestation, pregnancy, abdominal discomfort, and visual changes. Are there medications? Luprolide. Luprolide is a GnRH analog. Indications, fertility. If given pulsatile, the natural way the body releases GnRH, it inhibits estrogen and testosterone. If given continuously, It'll suppress LH and FSH with subsequent reduction of estrogen and testosterone. Used in uterine fibroids, advanced prostate cancer, since it decreases testosterone, 
luprolide, dysfunctional uterine bleeding, and premenstrual syndrome. Adverse effects of continuous dosing, hot flashes, depression, osteopenia due to the decreased estrogen, anti-androgen adverse effects. Next, danazole, or also known as danocrine. Danazole, like danabol, a anabolic steroid. It inhibits GnRH. So it's a hypoestrogenic and hyperandrogenic. Indications, endometriosis, suppresses LH and FSH production, fibrocystic breast changes, hereditary angioedema. Limited use due to hyperandrogenic adverse effects. Adverse effects, hyperandrogenic, weight gain, acne, hirsutism, virilization, and hepatic dysfunction. Next, we'll go into menstrual cycle basic physiology. Understanding the role of hormones in the menstrual cycle are critical to understanding this chapter. The follicular phase is during the first 14 days of the endometrium thickening under the influence of estrogen. In the ovaries, a dominant follicle matures, leading to ovulation. In the luteal phase, after ovulation, the ruptured follicle becomes the corpus luteum, secreting progesterone and some estrogen. Progesterone enhances the lining of the uterus to prepare it for implantation. If there is no implantation, the corpus luteum degenerates, leading to a steep decrease in both estrogen and progesterone. The steep drop in both hormones leads to menstruation. So phase one, the follicular phase, or the proliferative phase. This is days one to 12. Estrogen predominates in this phase. There's pulsatile GnRH from the hypothalamus, leading to increased FSH and LH from the pituitary to stimulate the ovaries. The ovaries then, in, due to the increased FSH, the FSH causes the follicle and egg maturation in the ovary. The increased LH stimulates the maturing follicle to produce estrogen. The endometrium of the uterus. Estrogen builds up the endometrium. This is indicative of proliferation. Estrogen causes negative feedback in the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian system. The increasing levels of estrogen inhibit hypothalamic GnRH release as well as pituitary release of LH and FSH. So no new follicles start maturing because it wants to just mature this one follicle. And then ovulation occurs during days 12 to 14. The increase in estrogen being released from the follicle, from the mature follicle, switches from negative to positive feedback on GnRH, oddly enough, causing a mutual increase in estrogen, FSH, and LH. And all of this occurs, and it's called the LH surge that causes ovulation, the egg release. So our estrogen switches from being in days 1 to 12 from negative feedback to days 12 to 14 to positive feedback on the HPO. Then phase two, which is the luteal phase or the secretory phase. This is days 14 to 28. And here, progesterone dominates. The LH surge also causes the ruptured follicle to become the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum secretes progesterone and estrogen, but mostly progesterone, to maintain the endometrial lining. Estrogen and progesterone switches back to negative feedback. If pregnancy occurs, the blastocyst, maturing zygote, keeps the corpus luteum functional, secreting estrogen and progesterone, which keeps the endometrium from sloughing off. GnRH pulses over an hour favors LH secretion. Less frequent pulses favors FSH secretion. So for the menstrual cycle, the order is maturing follicle, ovulation, corpus luteum, corpus albicans. And in the follicular phase, estradiol predominates, where FSH and LH are being secreted, and then you have the LH surge. Progesterone is still there in the follicular phase, but it's not predominant. In the luteal phase, progesterone rises, and estrogen is also there, but does not predominate. <clears throat> so menstruation, the first days of follicular phase. If the egg is not fertilized, the corpus luteum soon deteriorates, causing a fall of progesterone and estrogen. This has two effects. The endometrium is no longer maintained and sloughs off, leading to menstruation. The negative feedback on GnRH subsides, causing increase in pulsatile GnRH secretion. This leads to increased FSH and LH, which starts the follicle maturation process all over again. Next, into me menstrual disorders. 
abnormal menstrual bleeding. Unexplained abnormal bleeding in a non-pregnant woman in regards to quantity, schedule, or duration, formerly dysfunctional uterine bleeding. Anovulatory is 90%. The ovaries produce estrogen, but no ovulation, so no corpus luteum formation. Unopposed estrogen, from no progesterone, leads to endometrial growth and unpredictable shedding. From no progesterone, because the corpus luteum does not form because there's no ovulation. Clinical manifestations, abnormal bleeding with a relatively normal physical examination. Diagnosis, you want to get HCG and CBC. Also, there's no specific test for dysfunctional uterine bleeding. Workup, as indicated, may include beta HCG to rule out pregnancy, H and H, and ad additional tests for other uh, particular etiologies. Endometrial biopsy to rule out endometrial carcinoma should be done in all women over 35 years old with obesity, hypertension, or diabetes, and all patients with postmenopausal bleeding. So 35 to 50 with diabetes, obesity, hypertension, or over 50 years old period. Management of acute hemorrhage, IV high dose estrogen or high dose oral contraceptives stabilizes the endometrium. Chronic management, estrogen progestin contraceptive pills are the first line. Traditional OCPs, remember what they do. Um, traditional OCPs, decrease bleeding, decrease osteoporosis, ovarian cancer, um, dysfunctional or uh, dys, uh, dysmenorrhea, as well as hirsutism and edema. And their side effects are many. Estrogen progesterone contraceptive pills is the first line treatment. Progesterone if estrogen is contraindicated. Le levonorgestrel releasing IUD. NSAIDs can be used in patients unable or unwilling to be treated with hormonal therapy. Surgery, if not responsive to medical treatment, hysterectomy is the definitive management. Endometrial ablation in patients who do not want hysterectomy. Dysmenorrhea, painful menstruation that affects normal activities. Primary, due to increased prostaglandins, not due to pelvic pathology. Prostaglandins cause increase in uterine wall contractions. Usually starts one to two years after menarche onset in teenagers. Or it could be secondary, due to pelvis or uterine pathology, like endometriosis, PID, adenomyosis, and leomyomas. Clinical manifestations, recurrent, crampy, midline, lower abdominal or pelvic pain one to two days before or at the onset of menses, gradually diminishing over 12 to 72 hours. Pain may radiate to the lower back and thighs and may be associated with headache, nausea, or vomiting. Physical exam, normal if primary dysmenorrhea. Diagnosis of dysmenorrhea, labs and imaging not mandatory to exclude secondary, but should be done if pelvic disease is suspected. Management. Supportive therapy includes heat compresses, vitamin B, and vitamin E started two days prior to and for three days into menses. Exercise. NSAIDs or hormonal therapy are first-line medical management. NSAIDs started prior to the pain onset and given for two to three days. Hormonal therapy, estrogen, progesterone, contraceptive pills, or progestin only. Laparoscopy. Indicated if unresponsive to three cycles of initial therapy to rule out secondary causes. Most common cause of secondary in younger patients are PID and endometriosis. Next, premenstrual syndrome, PMS, cluster of physical, behavioral, and mood changes with cyclical occurrence during the luteal phase of the menstrual cycle. Premenstrual dysphoric disorder, severe PMS with functional impairment. So it's dysphoric if it's functional impairment as well where anger, irritability, and internal tension are predominant. Clinical manifestations, physical, abdominal bloating and fatigue are most common, breast swelling or pain, weight gain, headache, changes in bowel habits, muscle or joint pain, emotional, irritability most common, tension, depression, anxiety, hostility, libido changes, behavioral, food cravings, poor concentration, noise sensitivity, loss of motor senses. And for emotional, the irritability is hallmark. Diagnosis. Management. Diagnosis is symptoms occurring one to two weeks before menses in the luteal phase of the previous phase, 
relieved within two to three days of the onset of menses, plus at least seven symptom-free days during the follicular phase. Patients should record a diary of symptoms for over two cycles. The management is LSOG, lifestyle, SSRIs, oral contraceptives, and GNRH, LSOG. So lifestyle, you want to do stress reduction and exercise are the most beneficial. Caffeine, alcohol, cigarette, and salt reduction, NSAIDs, vitamin B6, and E. SSRIs are the first line medical management for premenstrual syndrome for emotional symptoms with dysfunction, like fluoxetine, sertraline, citalopram. OCPs, especially drospirinone-containing OCPs, which is a progestin, can be used in patients who do not want to take SSRIs. GNRH, agonist therapy, with estrogen and progestin add back if no response to SSRIs or OCPs. That's LSOG. Amenorrhea. So there's primary and secondary. First, primary amenorrhea. Failure of menarche onset by age 15 in the presence of secondary sex characteristics or age 13 in the absence of secondary sexual characteristics. So 15 in changes, 13 in no changes. Workup. All women with primary amenorrhea should have a HCG and FSH test, most importantly. Are there any follicles being stimulated, or are they pregnant? TSH, hyperthyroidism decreases menstruation, remember? And prolactin levels also are measured initially. Karyotyping done if increased FSH and little breast development to rule out Turner syndrome. So you do karyotyping if there's an increased FSH initially. The risk is Turner syndrome since they have since they have no breasts, but they have a normal FSH. So secondary amenorrhea, absence of menses for over three months in a patient with a previously normal menstruation, or over six months in a patient who was previously oligomenorrheic. Etiologies: pregnancy is the most common cause of amenorrhea. Hypothalamic dysfunction, functional hypothalamic amenorrhea, post puberty delay, do. Puberty delay do. Athletes, illness, anorexia. The female athlete triad, hypothalamic amenorrhea, eating disorders, and osteoporosis. Again, hypothalamic amenorrhea, eating disorders, and osteoporosis. Due to loss of bone pro protection by estrogen. FHA can cause secondary or primary amenorrhea. Pituitary dysfunction a prolactinoma or pituitary infarct, such as Sheehan syndrome, associated with decreased FSH, LH, and estrogen. Ovarian dysfunction, decreases estrogen and increases FSH and LH. PCOS, premature ovarian failure, follicular failure, or follicular resistance to LH and FSH. Also, Turner syndrome, may have symptoms of estrogen deficiency, similar to menopause. Uterine dysfunction, Asherman syndrome, acquired endometrial scarring secondary to postpartum hemorrhage after DNC or endometrial infection. Pelvic ultrasound, absence of normal uterine stripe or hysteroscopy. For the workup, beta HCG to rule out pregnancy is the best initial test. If HCG is negative, order serum prolactin, FSH, LH, TSH, and estrogen. Testosterone measured if evidence of hirsutism and hyperandrogenism. So comparing uterus present versus uterus absent and what the causes might be and whether breasts are absent or breasts are present. So if the uterus is present and breasts are present, then it might be an outflow obstruction, transverse vaginal septum, or an imperforate hymen. If the uterus is present and the breasts are absent, look at the hormones. So if they're elevated, increased FSH, increased LH, then it's an ovarian cause. Since the hormones, the pituitary is fine, it's just the ovaries, ovaries aren't getting it. Could be a premature ovarian failure, 46XX, or it could be a gonadal dysgenesis, like Turner's, which is a 45XO. Or if they're normal or low, a decreased FSH and decreased LH, then you want to think of hypothalamic pituitary failure, 
or pubertal delay, such as athletes, illness, or anorexia. Then if the uterus is absent and breasts are present, then you want to think of malarian agenesis, which is 46XX, or androgen insensitivity. Not a problem with estrogen since there are breasts present. If the uterus is absent and breasts are absent, this is very rare, usually caused by a defect in testosterone synthesis, presents like a phenotypic immature girl with primary amenorrhea, will often have intra-abdominal testes. Next, leomyomas or uterine fibroids, fibromyomas. Benign uterine smooth muscle tumors that derive from a muscle cell of the myometrium. Most common benign gynecologic tumor. Types, intramural, submucosal, subserosal, parasitic. The smooth muscle tumor. Risk factors, increased age, especially over 35. Five times more common in African Americans. Five times more common. Nulliparity, obesity, family history, hypertension. Pathophysiology is growth, is estrogen dependent. It may increase in size with relation to the menstrual cycle and ovulatory states, only estrogen and no progesterone, and during pregnancy and regress after menopause. For clinical manifestations, most are asymptomatic and found incidentally, especially if intramural. Bleeding is the most common symptom, menorrhagia or irregular bleeding, especially if submucosal. Dysmenorrhea, pelvic pressure or pain, also may affect fertility. Physical examination may have a palpable, firm, non-tender, asymmetric mobile mass or masses in the abdomen or pelvis on bimanual exam. Transvaginal ultrasound, most widely used initial imaging tests for suspected fibroids. Focal, heterogenic, hypoechoic mass or masses with shadowing. Management, observation, majority don't need treatment. Decision to treat is determined by symptoms, size or rate of tumor growth, and desire for fertility. Non-surgical, luprolide is the most effective medical management, but not usually used near menopause or to shrink fibroids prior to hysterectomy or myomectomy. Levonorgestrel releasing IUD, NSAIDs for dysmenorrhea. Surgical management, hysterectomy is the definitive treatment. Fibroids are the most common cause for hysterectomy. Myomectomy, used especially to preserve fertility. Other, uterine artery ablation, uh, embolization may preserve fertility if myomectomy is not an option. Endometrial ablation, both may affect the ability to conceive. So if they want to still have fertility, then myomectomy. If they do not want fertility, then hysterectomy. Exam tip, asymptomatic women, observation. Symptomatic women who desire fertility, non-surgical or myomectomy. Symptomatic women who do not desire fertility, non-surgical treatment or myomectomy or uterine artery embolization. Symptomatic women who des desiring definitive treatment, hysterectomy. Next, menopause. Cessation of menses over one year due to loss of ovarian function leading to decreased estrogen and progesterone production. The average age is in the U.S. 50 to 52, premature if under 40. Clinical manifestations, estrogen deficiency, menstrual cycle alterations, vasomotor instability, including hot flashes, most common perimenopausal symptom, sleep disturbances, mood changes, skin, nail, and hair changes, increased cardiovascular events, hyperlipidemia, osteoporosis, dyspareunia, painful intercourse, vaginal atrophy and urinary incontinence, physical exam for menopause, decreased bone mineral density, dry and thin skin with decreased elasticity, vaginal atrophy with thin mucosa, decrease in breast size, diagnosis, FSHSA, most sensitive initial test, increased serum FSH over 30, Increased LH and decreased estrogen, but FSH is the big one for this. Androstenedione levels don't change. Estrone is the main predominant estrogen after menopause. 
Complications, loss of estrogen's protective effects lead to osteoporosis, hyperlipidemia, and increased cardiovascular risk. Management of vasomotor insufficiency and hot flashes. Hormone replacement therapy, risks versus benefits must be considered. Estrogen only, if no uterus. Estrogen plus progesterone, if uterus is still present. We want to be cautious of endometrial cancer here. And second line for management of vasomotor insufficiency and hot flashes will be SSRIs, paroxetine or gabapentin. Management of vaginal atrophy, we'll see below. Vulvovaginal atrophy, seen in hypoestrogenic states, menopause, postpartum lactation, postpartum women, progesterone only or low-dose oral contraceptives. Clinical manifestations, vaginal dryness, dyspareunia, vaginal inflammation, infection or recurrent UTIs with increased pH, loss of lactobacilli, which normally converts glucose to lactic acid. Management, vaginal moisturizers, improved symptoms of dyspareunia, dryness, but no effect on atrophy. Topical vaginal estrogens are the safest, most effective medical therapy. Can come in cream, vaginal ring, or trochs. Adverse effects, vaginal bleeding, breast pain, nausea, VTE, DVT, PE, endometrial cancer. Less risk compared to oral estrogens. Estrogen increases hepatic production of coagulation factors as well. Ospemifene is a serum that is an estrogen agonist in the, in the vagina and bone, but it's an estrogen antagonist in the breast and uterus. So decreasing breast and endometrial cancer, also helping atrophy and, in, and helping the bones as well. So this is very good treatment for vulvovaginal atrophy and the osteoporosis postmenopausal is ospemifene. Ospemifene. Next, hormonal replacement therapy. Estrogen only if no uterus, estrogen and progesterone if uterus is still present. Indications for HRT, healthy women under 60 for menopausal symptom relief, vasomotor, mood changes, vaginal atrophy. Decreased osteoporosis risk. risk of, risks of hormone replacement therapy. DVT, PE, endometrial cancer, especially with estrogen only. Breast cancer risk with estrogen progesterone therapy is controversial. Contraindications to hormonal therapy. Woman with increased risk of cardiovascular disease, thromboembolic disease, stroke, endometrial or breast cancer. History of liver disease. Tamoxifen. Mechanism of action. CIRM. Tamoxifen is an estrogen antagonist in the breast, but an estrogen agonist in the endometrium, bone, liver, creates coag factors. Treatment of, tre treatment of ER breast cancer and inhibits estrogen, but increases estrogen in the bone, endometrium, and liver. So indications for tamoxifen is an adjuvant treatment in estrogen and progesterone receptor positive breast cancer breast cancer prevention, and osteopro osteoporosis prevention in postmenopausal women. Adverse effects, however, increased risk of endometrial cancer, venous thromboembolism, hot flashes, induces menopause, and ocular toxicity. Raloxifene mechanism is a serum as well. Raloxifene is an estrogen agonist in the bone, but an estrogen antagonist in the breast and endometrium, whereas tamoxifen is an agonist in the endometrium. Indications, breast cancer prevention in high-risk women and osteoporosis prevention in postmenopausal women. Adverse effects, weight gain, VTE, although less than tamoxifen, and hot flashes. So raloxifene is pretty good because it's for osteoporosis and it helps prevent breast cancer and endometrial. Next, adenomyosis. Islands of endometrial tissue within the myometrium, the muscular layer of the uterine wall, as opposed to fibroids, which is the smooth muscle in the ectopic areas of the tumor areas of the tumor benign. But this is endometrial tissue, adenomyosis. That's why it's more squishy as opposed to 
the fibroids, which are smooth muscular tissue. Risk factors most commonly presents later in reproductive years, ages 35 to 50, endometriosis, fibroids. Clinical manifestations, menorrhagia, progressively worsens, increase of endometrial tissue, which acts the same way and it bleeds. Dysmenorrhea and chronic pelvic pain may also cause infertility. And on physical exam, unlike fibroids, this will be a symmetrically, uniformly enlarged, globular, boggy uterus, may be tender. Diagnosis, clinical diagnosis of exclusion of secondary amenorrhea to rule out pregnancy, endometriosis, and fibroids. We want to do a transvaginal ultrasound, and an MRI is the most accurate. Post-total abdominal hysterectomy examination of the uterus is definitive diagnosis. Management, conservative management used to preserve fertility, analgesics, progesterins, levonorgestrel releasing IUD, aromatase inhibitors. Total abdominal hysterectomy is the only effective therapy. Endometritis. Infection of the decidua, pregnancy endometrium. Usually polymicrobial, often vaginal flora, aerobic, anaerobic. Risk factors, postpartum or postabortal uterine infection. C-section is the biggest risk factor. Prolonged rupture of membranes over 24 hours. Vaginal delivery, dilation and curettage or evacuation. Multiple pelvic examinations, also a risk for endometritis. Chorioamnionitis, fetal membrane infection. Diagnosis, mainly a clinical diagnosis. They'll have fever, over 100.4, tachycardia, abdominal pain, uterine tenderness, two to three days after C-section, postpartum, postabortal, may present later, may have vaginal bleeding or discharge, foul-smelling lochia, Management of post-C-section, clinda and gent, clinda covers the gram positives and anaerobes, and gent covers the gram negatives, aminoglycoside covers gram negatives, may add ampicillin for additional GBS coverage, augmentin or unison is a alternative. Management after vaginal delivery or chorioamnionitis, ampicillin and gentamicin. For prophylaxis, First-generation cephalosporin, like cefazolin, one dose during C-section may be given to reduce the incidence. Remember, you give this 60 minutes before C-section. Next, endometriosis. Implantation of endometrial tissue, the stroma and the gland, outside of the uterus. Pathophysiology, ectopic endometrial tissue responds to cyclical hormonal changes. So that um, location is ovaries are the most common site. Other sites include the posterior cul-de-sac, the broad and uterosacral ligaments, and the rectosigmoid colon, as well as the bladder. So adenomyosis is also endometrial tissue, but not outside the uterus, which is why imaging helps this endometriosis. Risk factors, prolonged estrogen exposure, nulliparity, late first pregnancy, early menarche, short menstrual cycles, family history, heavy menstruation, especially nulliparity. Anything that increases the amount of cycles because growth occurs ectopically. The peak incidence is between 25 and 35. And remember, fibroids and adenomyosis are 35 to 50. Clinical manifestations, the classic triad of Cyclic premenstrual pelvic pain one to two weeks before menstruation, dysmenorrhea, painful menstruation, and dyspareunia, painful intercourse. Not menorrhagia like adenomyosis because it's ectopic, it's not in the uterus. It sometimes can be though. May have dyskesia, painful defecation, or abnormal bleeding. May also have back pain pre- or post-menstrual spotting, asymptomatic in one-third, infertility as well. Physical exam, usually normal, but may have a fixed tender adnexal mass, a fixed retroverted uterus, 
or nodular thickening of the uterosacral ligament, common to have a retroverted uterus. Diagnosis is clinical. Ultrasound is the initial imaging to rule out other causes, but laparoscopy with biopsy is definitive diagnosis. You'll find raised patches of thickening, discolored, scarred, or powdered burn appears implants on the tissue. Endometrioma. Endometriosis involves ovaries large enough to be considered a tumor, usually filled with old blood appearing as a chocolate-colored chocolate cyst. Medical or conservative management, ovulation suppression, combined OCPs are first line, NSAIDs may be given for the pain, progestins like levonorgestrel releasing IUD, also luprolide, a GnRH agonist, danazol, an androgen not commonly used. Surgical management, conservative laparoscopy with ablation of endometrial of ectopic endometrial tissue used if fertility is desired. Total abdominal hysterectomy and bilateral salpingo ophorectomy if no desire for fertility. Endometrial hyperplasia. Once again, don't forget the most common causes of gynecologic cancers, EOC. E endometrial, O ovarian, C cervical. Endometrial gland proliferation with cytologic atypia, precursor to endometrial carcinoma, the most common postmenopausal or increasing age in premenopausal women. Risk factors for endometrial hyperplasia, prolonged unopposed estrogen, constantly builds up the endometrial walls and sheds at random times, and this the cell proliferation is constant. Chronic anovulation, estrogen-only therapy, PCOS, obesity, perimenopause, early menarche, late menopause, Lynch syndrome, don't forget polyps in endometrial, endometrial tissue, and tamoxifen. Hyperplasia occurs within three years of estrogen-only therapy. Clinical manifestations, abnormal uterine bleeding, menorrhagia, metamenorrhagia, postmenopausal bleeding, may be associated with vaginal discharge. For diagnosis, Transvaginal ultrasound is the best screening test. You'll find a thickened endometrial stripe over 4 millimeters on transvaginal ultrasound. Endometrial biopsy is the definitive diagnosis, indicated if over 35 years old, increased endometrial stripe seen on transvaginal ultrasound. Also patients with unopposed estrogen therapy, tamoxifen, persistent bleeding with a thick stripe. Remember, over 4 millimeters. Management hyperplasia without atypia, you can do progestin, not estrogen, and this can be oral or IUD. Repeat endometrial biopsy in three to six months. Hyperplasia with atypia, you want to do a total abdominal hysterectomy. Progestin treatment is not used. If a surgical, progestinal treatment is used if not a surgical candidate or if patient wishes to preserve fertility. Remember, hyperplasia occurs within three years of estrogen-only therapy. Next, endometrial cancer, most common gynecologic malignancy in the U.S., two times more common than cervical cancer. Remember your EOC. Endo adenocarcinoma is the most common type, over 80%. Papillary serous clear cell and adenosquamous cell and mucinous are also possible. And remember, overall, for EOC, the different types of um, cells that are there. So for E, endometrial, adenoma is the most common. For O, ovarian, epithelial is the most common. And for C, cervical, squamous is the most common. So it mainly affects postmenopausal women for this endometrial cancer. 50 to 60 year old is the peak. Perimenopausal is 25%. Estrogen-dependent cancer associated with antecedent endometrial hyperplasia. Combined OCPs are protective against both ovarian and endometrial cancer, but estrogen alone is a risk factor. Estrogen alone is a risk factor increasing ovulatory cycles, such as nulliparity, early menarche, late menopause, chronic anovulation, PCOS, obesity, estrogen-only hormonal therapy, Tamoxifen, remember treatment for breast cancer.
cancer, estrogen receptive, but a risk factor for endometrial. Also diabetes mellitus and Lynch syndrome, hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer. Clinical manifestations, abnormal uterine bleeding, postmenopausal bleeding, pre or perimenopausal bleeding, menorrhagia or metarrhagia. Diagnosis, transvaginal ultrasound, thickened endometrial stripe over four millimeters. Endometrial biopsy, definitive diagnosis. Management, stage one, Total abdominal hysterectomy with bilateral salpingo orophorectomy may be needed post-op radiation therapy. Most are well differentiated, one of the most curable gynecologic cancers. Stage 2 or 3, you need the top so plus the lymph node excision with or without post-op radiation. In stage 4, which is advanced, you need systemic chemo. Next, postmenopausal bleeding. <clears throat> Etiologies, usually benign. Vaginal endometrial atrophy, cervical polyps, submucosal fibroids. 10% due to endometrial cancer. Any postmenopausal bleeding in a woman not on hormonal replacement therapy or on hormonal replacement therapy with abnormal bleeding should raise suspicion for endometrial carcinoma, hyperplasia, leomyosarcoma. Diagnosis, TBUS, usually initially initial diagnostic test. If the endometrial stripe is under 4 millimeters, repeat in 4 months. If continued bleeding, do a biopsy. Endometrial biopsy with a stripe over 4 millimeters. Hysterectomy may be warranted if focal thickening of the endometrium. Uterine prolapse. Uterine herniation into the vagina. Risk factors. Weakening of the pelvic support structures. Most common after childbirth especially traumatic. Increased pelvic floor pressure, multiple vaginal births, obesity, and repeated heavy lifting. Clinical manifestations, vaginal fullness, heaviness, or a falling out sensation. Low back pain, abdominal pain. Symptoms may be worse with prolonged standing and relieved by lying down with gravity. Urinary urgency, frequency, or stress incontinence. On physical exam, there may be a bulging mass, especially with increased intra-abdominal pressure, like Valsalva. So they're graded one, 0 through 4 for a uterine prolapse. 0 is no descent, and 4 is all the way through the hymen. Grade 1 is uterus descent into the upper two-thirds of the vagina. Grade 2 is the cervix approaches the introitus. Grade 3 is the cervix is outside the introitus. Grade four is the entire uterus is outside of the vagina, complete rupture. May be accompanied by a cystocele, posterior bladder herniating into the anterior vagina, or an enterocele, also known as the pouch of Douglas, which is a small bowel herniating into the upper vagina, or a rectocele, distal sigmoid colon or rectum herniating into the posterior distal vagina. Conservative management. Kegel exercises, behavioral modification, weight control, pessaries um, elevate and support the uterus. Estrogen treatment may improve atrophy. Surgical management, hysterectomy or uterus sparing techniques, including uterosacral or sacrospinous ligament fixation. Next, we'll move to ovarian disorders. First, physiologic ovarian cysts. Fluid-filled sac within the ovaries, most commonly related to ovulation, usually unilateral. Common in reproductive years. Most spontaneously resolve within a few weeks. Most are asymptomatic, may be associated with abnormal uterine bleeding or dyspareunia. Physiologic types. Follicular cysts are the most common. Occurs when follicles fail to rupture and continue to grow. Corpus luteal cysts fail to degenerate after ovulation. Theca lutein cysts. Excess beta HCG causes hyperplasia of the theca interna cells, but this is very rare. Physical exam, unilateral pelvic pain or tenderness, mobile palpable cystic adnexal mass. Diagnosis, transvaginal ultrasound. Follicular, smooth, thin-walled, unilocular. Corpus luteal, complex, thicker-walled with peripheral vascularity. So the corpus luteum is more thick anyways, so the cyst will be much thicker. 
If they're low risk for malignancy, you'll see anechoic, unilocular, fluid-filled cysts, no echo because it's fluid-filled, high risk for malignancy, there'll be solid, nodular, thick septations that are high risk for malignancy, order a beta HCG to rule out pregnancy, remember, excess HCG in thecolutein cysts, suspicious of malignancy, you can get tumor markers like CA125, alpha fetoprotein, and beta HCG even. Management. If under 8 centimeters, you want to do supportive. Most cysts under 8 centimeters are functional and usually spontaneously resolve. Do rest, NSAIDs, and repeat ultrasound after 1 to 2 cycles. OCPs may prevent recurrence, but don't treat existing cysts. Management of over 8 or persistent. You might do a laparoscopy or laparotomy. Management if postmenopausal. Options include laparoscopy or laparotomy, if large, or if a tumor marker CA125 is elevated. Cysts in postmenopausal women are considered to be malignant until proven otherwise. Must work up for cancer regardless. Ruptured physiologic ovarian cyst is next. Asymptomatic or sudden onset of unilateral lower abdominal pain, often sharp and focal, often occurring during sexual activity or strenuous physical activity. Abnormal uterine bleeding. Physical examination, unilateral pelvic pain or tenderness, may have a mobile palpable cystic adnexal mass, may have signs of hemodynamic compromise if massive bleeding, although it's not common. Diagnosis, transvaginal ultrasound, initial test of choice. You'll see adnexal mass plus pelvic fluid in patients with symptoms consistent with rupture. Fluid can be a normal finding as well. You could also get a beta HCG and CBC. Management of uncomplicated ruptured physiologic ovarian cysts is expectant management, observation, analgesics, and rest. Uncomplicated, the absence of the following, hemodynamic instability, large volume or ongoing blood loss, fever, leukocytosis, or suspicion of malignancy. Stable and significant hemoperitoneum, hospitalization, close observation, and fluid replacement. If they're hemodynamically unstable or ongoing hemorrhage, laparoscopy usually preferred over laparotomy. Cystectomy is preferred over ophorectomy in premenopausal women. Next, ovarian cancer. Remember, EOC, ovarian cancer, the second most common type. Fifth most common cancer in American women, and second most common gynecologic cancer with the highest mortality of all gynecologic cancers. Over 90% are epithelial, especially seen postmenopausal. Risk factors, increased lifetime exposure of estrogen, increased number of ovulation cycles, nulliparity, infertility, over 50 years old, early menarche, late menopause. Family history, 7% lifetime risk instead of a normal 1 to 2%. Caucasian race, genetic, BRCA1 or BRCA2 are 15 to 40%. Putes, Jaegers, melanosis of the lips. Uh, Turner syndrome, Lynch syndrome as well, which is the HNPCC. Clinical manifestations of ovarian cancer, rarely symptomatic until late in the disease when extensive METs are present. You may have GI, abdominal fullness or distension, increased abdominal girth and weight loss, back or abdominal pain, early satiety, constipation or bowel obstruction due to intestinal compression, urinary frequency, irregular menses, menorrhagia, postmenopausal bleeding. On physical exam, palpable abdominal or ovarian mass, solid, fixed, and irregular, ascites, um, pleural effusion, Sister Mary Joseph nodes, which are meths to the umbilical nodes, also seen in gastric cancer. Diagnosis, pelvic ultrasound is the initial test of choice. Additional workup includes staging imaging, CT of the abdomen, baseline CA125, mammography, chest radiograph, pap smear, colonoscopy. So for management of ovarian cancer, stage one is a surgical removal, um, total abdominal hysterectomy plus a bilateral salpingo ophorectomy plus selective lymphadenectomy. Stage 2 through 4, surgical removal followed by platinum-based chemo, cisplatin or carboplatin plus 
Pasilexel. Serum CA125 levels used to monitor treatment progress. Prognosis? Because ovarian cancer presents late in the disease course and is usually metastatic at presentation, it is associated with a generally poor prognosis. Because, uh, Bartholin cysts, Bartholin cyst and abscess. Clinical manifestations. If it's an infected gland, there's pain and tenderness. Unilateral vulvar mass, edema or inflammation, may be fluctuant and loculated if an abscess is present. Localized pain and tenderness, dyspareunia. If it's not infected, it'll likely be non-tender, unilateral vulvar mass at the Bartholin duct location. Diagnosis, CBC in culture of the, and culture of drained fluid, including for STIs. Management if infected. Incision and drainage with or without placement of a word catheter for continuous drainage under local anesthesia. Immediate pain relief occurs upon drainage of pus. Antibiotic therapy if severe infection or patients with risk, of, with, with risk factors of recurrent abscesses. Asymptomatic cysts, no intervention. Recurrent, a word catheter can be placed after the IND to allow continued drainage. Marsupialization may be needed in patients with recurrent cysts. So marsupialization is cutting open, stitching shut with a continuous drain to a pouch, like a marsupial. Next, benign ovarian neoplasms. In women of reproductive age, 90% of ovarian neoplasms are benign. The risk of malignancy increases with age. Types, surface epithelial tumors, stromal tumors, and germ cell tumors. Dermoid ovarian cysts, such as mature cystic teratoma, is the most common benign ovarian neoplasm. This may contain tissue derived from all three germ cell layers, sebaceous fluid, hair, bone, teeth, has a small malignancy potential, um, 0.2 to 2%. This is a totipotential germ cell, all three layers. Clinical manifestations, generally asymptomatic, usually an incidental finding. May lead to ovarian torsion or rarely may rupture. Physical exam, normal or adnexal fullness. Diagnosis, pelvic ultrasound. Cystic structure that may contain calcifications, because it probably has teeth and hyperechoic nodules because all the different types of tissue. Management, surgical removal, laparoscopic cystectomy is preferred due to potential risk of torsion or malignant transformation. Salpingo oophorectomy is another option. Next, ovarian torsion. This is complete or partial rotation of the ovary on its ligamental supports. This can compromise ovarian blood flow. Prolonged ischemia may lead to infarction. Etiologies, usually a mechanical complication in patients with functional ovarian cysts or ovarian neoplasm, especially if over 5 centimeters. Over 8 centimeters, you want to consider surgery. Clinical manifestations, unilateral pelvic pain, usually acute, may be associated with nausea and vomiting for ovarian torsion. On physical exam, abdominal tenderness or adnexal mass. Diagnosis, Ultrasound with Doppler is the initial test of choice. You'll see decreased ovarian blood flow. Normal flow does not exclude torsion, so definitive diagnosis is made during surgical exploration. So Doppler for flow, but you can't rule it out with that. Management, laparoscopy with detorsion to restore blood flow. Ovarian cystectomy may be needed to remove responsible cyst and preserve the ovary in premenopausal women. Necrotic or malignant, salpingo oophorectomy. PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, characterized by bilateral cystic ovaries, insulin resistance, and hyperandrogenism, also known as Stein-Leventhal syndrome. Pathophysiology, increased LH leads to increased testosterone production, decreased FSH production, leads to follicular degeneration in bilateral cystic ovaries. So LH increase to the testes, decreased FSH, follicular degeneration. Well, increased LH not to the testes, but increased testosterone production itself. Clinical manifestation, menstrual dysfunction, 
oligomenorrhea or secondary amenorrhea, increased androgen hirsutism, coarse hair on the face, neck, abdomen, acne, and male pattern baldness, also insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, obesity, and hypertension. Physical exam, bilateral enlarged smooth mobile ovaries on bimanual exam, acanthosis nigricans. Diagnosis, diagnosis based on Rotterdam criteria, two, or two of three criteria. So you got to have lab or clinical findings like hirsutism, acne, male pattern baldness, two, amenorrhea or oligomenorrhea, and three, cystic ovaries on ultrasound. Labs, increased testosterone, such as DHEA, increased LH to FSH ratio, over three to one. So LH, remember, creates the test testosterone from the Leydig cells, you can remember. Pelvic ultrasound, bilateral enlarged ovaries and multiple ovarian cysts with a classic string of pearls appearance. GnRH agonist stimulation test, you'll see a rise in serum hydroxyprogesterone. So the agonist increases the hormones of progesterone. Lipid panel glucose tolerance test for diabetes. Management, lifestyle changes, diet, exercise, weight loss, decreased insulin resistance. This is a goal of management. Combination of OCPs is the mainstay. You also want to reduce the endometrial hyperplasia through the uh, uh, estrogen progesterone OCP. Also anti-androgenetic agents. Spironolactone blocks testosterone receptors. As you'll remember, the gynecomastia as a side effect may be added if symptoms persist after OCPs. Also, you could use luprolide or finasteride. Remember, a BPH drug blocks conversion of one testosterone to another. Are other anti-androgenics. So, spironolactone, luprolide, finasteride. If you want to treat the infertility, cl clomiphene, clomid, is a selective estrogen receptor modulator that reestablishes ovulation in anovulatory women who wish to get pregnancy. Metformin is also important in patients with abnormal LH to FSH ratios, by, which may improve menstrual frequency by reducing insulin, leading to weight loss and prevents diabetes. So PCOS is characterized by hyperinsulinemia. Wedged resection may also help restore ovulation if clomiphene is ineffective. Prognosis, untreated PCOS is associated with an increased risk of metabolic syndrome, diabetes mellitus, cardiovascular disease, dyslipidemia, endometrial hyperplasia, and endometrial cancer. Next, vaginal cancer. Rare, 1% of gynecologic malignancies. The peak incidence is 60 to 65. Primary tumors are rare. Squamous cell carcinoma is the most common primary tumor. More commonly, vaginal cancers occur as a secondary tumor, secondary to cervical, vulvar, or a distant source. And remember, squamous cell, vaginal and cervix. Um, risk factors, same risk factors as cervical neoplasia. HPV is a risk factor, type 16 and 18, cause approximately 70% of all cervical cancers worldwide and nearly 90% of all anal cancers, or pharyngeal cancer, vulvar, vaginal, and penile. <laughs> Clinical manifestations, abnormal vaginal bleeding, most common symptom, postcoital, intermenstrual, or postmenopausal, watery vaginal discharge may be symptomatic. Diagnosis, on visualization, the lesion may appear as a mass, plaque, or an ulcer. The posterior wall of the upper one-third of the vagina is the most common site near the cervix, which makes sense as it typically can be secondary to a cervical cancer. So that's the posterior wall of the upper one-third of the vagina as the most common site. Management of stage one, surgical excision or radiation therapy for primary vaginal cancer that's primary, up to 15% will develop vaginal stenosis or sexual dysfunction after treatment, so the use of vaginal dilator may be needed. Stage two to four, chemo radiation. Radiation alone is an alternative. Cancer of the vulva. Once again, squamous cell carcinoma is the most common. 
Also could be a mel melanoma. Clear cell adenocarcinoma is linked to DES exposure in utero. Paget's disease is a vulvar intraepithelial neoplasia that is superficial lesion of the epithelium that has not invaded the basement membrane, precancerous, may progress to carcinoma in situ or squamous cell carcinoma. Risk factors, again, HPV 16 and 18, most commonly seen in postmenopausal. You'll have vaginal itching, labia majora may be the most common, most common site, and but rarely the clitoris or Bartholin glands. Physical exam, red or white ulcerative or raised crusted lesion. Red or white ulcerative or raised crusted lesion. Diagnosis by biopsy, and you can use that acetic acid or tulidine blue application, may help in the biopsy. And management, excision, radiation, chemo, 5-fluorouracil. So now we'll go into other infectious disorders. Importantly, pelvic inflammatory disease. This is an ascending infection of the upper reproductive tract. The etiologies are usually mixed. Could be chlamydia trachomatis, most common, Neisseria gonorrhea, Gardnella vaginalis, uh, Mycoplasma genitalium, anaerobes, um, enteric or respiratory pathogens. Risk factors, multiple sexual partners, unprotected sex, prior PID, age 15 to 19, nulliparis, IUD placement. Clinical manifestations, pelvic or lower abdominal pain, dysuria, dyspareunia, vaginal discharge or bleeding, nausea or vomiting. Physical exam, lower abdominal tenderness, fever, purulent cervical discharge. Cervical motion tenderness, chandelier sign. Diagnosis, primary clinical, abdominal tenderness, cervical motion tenderness, adnexal tenderness, plus at least one of the following, positive gram stain, high temperature, white blood cells over 10K, pus on caldocentesis or laparoscopy, pelvic abnormalities on biomanual exam or ultrasound, increased ESR or CRP. Workup includes pregnancy tests to rule out ectopic and nuclear acid amplification tests, the NAAT, for gonorrhea chlamydia. Laparoscopy is the most accurate test for PID, although it's rarely performed, although it may be done in certain cases such as severe disease or no improvement with antibiotics. Outpatient management, ceftriaxone IM plus doxy, 100 milligrams times 14 days, metronidazole, 500 milligrams times 14 days, often added. Levofloxacin plus metronidazole are alternatives if true penicillin allergy. Not azithromycin anymore, it's doxycycline. And you also do 500 milligrams of ceftriaxone IM once. Inpatient management, that was outpatient. Inpatient is a second gen cephalosporin like cefoxetin or cefotetin and IV doxy. Clinda and Gent are alternatives if pregnancy or true penicillin allergy. An important complication next is Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome. This is perihepatitis with hepatic fibrosis, scarring, and peritoneal surface of the anterior right upper quadrant in the setting of pelvic inflammatory disease. So the liver capsule will get fibrosed and scarred, seen in 10% of women with PID. Clinical manifestations are right upper quadrant pain due to perihepatitis, may radiate to the right shoulder, Physical exam, right upper quadrant tenderness, laparoscopic, or diagnosis is laparoscopy, and you'll see the violin string adhesions on the anterior liver surface. Often have normal LFTs or slight elevations. That's violin string adhesions. Next, bacterial vaginosis. This is an overgrowth of Gardnella vaginalis and anaerobes due to altered biome. You have a decreased lactobacillus acidophilus. Lactobacillus acidophilus normally maintains vaginal pH. Although it is not a sexually transmitted infection, it is more common in sexually active women with new or multiple partners due to changes in the vaginal biome. So the biome is altered, a decrease in lactobacillus. Their acidophilus 
they're acid loving. So therefore, you'd be able to see a decrease in that, so a increase in the alkalotic pH. So you'll see a vaginal pH of over 4.5. Uh, clinically, you'll see malodorous vaginal discharge, worse after sex, vaginal itching, burning, and dyspareunia. Diagnosis is based on the AMSL criteria. You see copious, thin, homogeneous, grayish-white vaginal discharge, vaginal pH over 4.5, positive with amine test, a fishy odor when a drop of 10% KOH potassium is added, Clue cells on saline, wet mount, epithelial cells covered by bacteria are clue cells. You also see few white blood cells, as it's not inflammatory, and few lactobacilli. Management, metronidazole for seven days, gel or oral, or clinda also works. Both are safe in pregnancy. Partners do not need treatment, as opposed to other STDs. Treatment for asymptomatic non-pregnant women is not indicated. Prevention, avoid smoking. Pregnancy complications include premature rupture of membranes, chorioamnionitis, and preterm labor. Next, trichomoniasis. Trichomonas vaginalis is a flagellated protozoan that is transmitted sexually. Clinical manifestations are vaginitis, cystitis, or cervicitis. Copious malodorous vaginal discharge, worse with menses. Postcoital bleeding, dyspareunia, dysuria, and frequency. For men, most men are asymptomatic but may develop urethritis. Physical exam, copious, frothy, yellow-green vaginal discharge. Vulvovaginal erythema. And you'll also see cervical petechiae, which is also called a strawberry cervix, also a friable cervix. Diagnosis, microscopic examination, saline wet mount, mobile protozoan trophozoites, Vaginal pH over 4.5, like BV, and increased white blood cells. Although in BV, we do not see increased white blood cells. NAAT or a culture is performed if wet mount is negative. Management is metronidazole, 2 grams orally, times 1 dose, or 500 milligrams twice a day for 7 days. You can also do tinidazole. Treatment is indicated for both symptomatic and asymptomatic men and women and also partners must be treated. For follow-up, because of the high rates of reinfection, retesting with NAAT is performed within three months of the initial treatment. And for reinfection, you do metronidazole, 500 milligrams orally, BID for seven days. Single dose therapy should be avoided if it's recurrent. Any complications? Increased risk of HIV transmission, complications during pregnancy. Next, we'll start, talk about Candida. Candida albicans overgrowth. This is part of the normal flora due to a change in the normal vaginal environment, such as the use of antibiotics. It's increased risk in diabetes, steroids, and pregnancy. Vaginal and vulvar erythema, swelling, burning, and pruritus. Burning, with, burning when urine torches. Oh, when urine touches skin, dysuria, and dyspareunia. Thick curd-like cottage cheese discharge is noted, and the vaginal pH will also be normal. The whiff test will be negative, but my, on microscopy you'll see hyphae and yeast on spores on the KOH prep. The treatment is fluconazole, PO times one dose, and intravaginal antifungals as well. Clotrimazole, nystatin, myconazole. For prevention, you want to keep the vagina dry Use 100% cotton underwear. Avoid tight-fitting clothes. Avoid use of feminine deodorants and bubble baths. And that will complete the audio Pants Prep Pearls for Women's Health Reproductive System.